This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. And um, since this evening's work session is focusing on the uh, Sheriff's Office presentation, I'm going to turn things over to Chief Richardson and let him proceed. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you can, uh, as you know, for the we did a uh, assessment of the police department uh, uh, in the fall of uh, last year into the uh, spring of this year, and uh, we were directed by the council in the spring to go out and look at alternatives other than having our own police department. And so we've been working on that uh, throughout the summer. I apologize for some of the delays, but uh, things have happened over the course of the summer and COVID and everything else that uh, sometimes takes longer to get the answers to things. But I'd like to start off with uh, uh, slide number, the next slide, please. Uh, as you know, uh, the Senate uh, the assessment pointed out uh, some, some def uh, deficiencies in the uh, police department. Obviously, the police department is underfunded and understaffed. Uh, they have a minimal workload when you compare it to uh, other police departments, especially when you look at the, the center police department, only about 16% of their total staff time is actually utilized either doing calls for service work via 911 or officer-initiated activity where officers are actually out there stopping cars. So you've got about 81% uh, of the time uh, that is spent is non-productive time. They have insufficient equipment, uh, such as less lethal weapons. Other than tasers, uh, the center doesn't have any other types of less lethal weapons like other departments do. Uh, they did not have uh, full deployment of patrol rifles uh, like other departments do. They didn't have body cams like some departments do and others are going to next, uh, uh, next year. They had uh, insufficient uh, budget staffing to implement police reform legislation, which is uh, impacting law enforcement all over the state. Yeah, it's been going on for a couple of years. We've been impacted by legislation and it's going to continue next year uh, with uh, uh, additional legislation uh, that they're going to go after. One of the things they're going to do next year is uh, probably pass legislation, make it easier to uh, uh, sue police departments and cities. We're non-competitive recruitment wise. We have limited career opportunities and promotional opportunities. We don't offer anything other than patrol. And we don't have any really promotional opportunities other than it hopefully in somebody's career they might get promoted to sergeant and we have an obsolete police facility as we've mentioned before it's an old building it was built in the 1970s converted fire department doesn't have uh, locker room facilities for females doesn't have adequate interview rooms doesn't have a, a detention facility that's legal doesn't have a training room so, uh, things that you would find in any modern day constructed police department uh, next slide please So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the center police department. If you staff the police department, the full staffing where they should be and where they, uh, without uh, you know the deficits, deficits we've had over the years, uh, we budgeted nine commissioned police employees. And that would be a chief, two sergeants and six officers. That would give you three officers on each team to cover the clock 24 seven. And the reason we were adding that additional position is because with uh, your, with the uh, staffing we had and the amount of time off that people have for re uh, various reasons, including training mandates, uh, family leave, vacations, everything else, we need to have enough staff in there to help cover that vacancy factor. As people's as the vacancy rate goes up and people are gone more and more, you need to fill those holes with bodies. And so that's why we're uh, want to do nine police officers total. We want to add the records clerk back. That's Danny's position. If we get body cameras, they, we need to have somebody that can process the public records request because not only are you going to get them from the public, but you've also got to provide them to the uh, prosecutor's office, uh, the defense attorney, those kinds of things. And that's uh, so we were shooting for a part time police employee for that. We want to offer some type of recruitment incentives for the police officers and the police chief. If you, uh, as you know now, for lateral police officers, Ridgefield is offering $20,000 hiring bonus, and we need to at least match that. Uh, and in some cases, we may want to do some other kind of incentive. Perhaps it's an incentive to our own employees that if they get uh, have a friend that we hire through their recommendation, that perhaps they get some kind of bonus. So we're trying to leverage all the different resources to try to get uh, police employees recruit. Uh, uh, 
staff. And obviously, uh, we have to have full funding for all of our training mandates that are coming down. And we have to have sufficient equipment to comply with police reform laws and best practices, which includes body cameras. And as an option, uh, a secondary one would be fleet cameras. There's benefits to both. The ultimate uh, best practice would be to have both. If you can look at our budget uh, on the lines to the right there, you can see that Bridgefield and Battleground, which are green and blue, their budgets since 2015 have gone up substantially. And uh, you can see they're constantly, for the most part, in an upward uh, direction, where our budget has actually gone down uh, over the years and is actually in a downward uh, position. If you look at what the 2022 proposed budget is, which is the true cost of a police department fully funded, uh, you're looking at about $2.1 million. And if you added that $1.2 million onto the end of that red line there, that would then turn that line upward. It would be uh, climbing about the same direction as uh, Ridgefield, but not as steep, but it would still be under what Ridgefield, obviously a bigger department, bigger city, is gonna spend more money. Next slide, please. So we compared two options, uh, our own police department with CCSO, obviously the blue bullet points are our police department. We have questionable long-term uh, sustainability uh, with limited funding. We have increasing cost in equipment training and staffing to meet police reform legislation. We have limited career development opportunities that impact our recruitment, but not only our recruitment, but our retention. We have low call for service demand in comparison to staffing costs. We have a very expensive uh, staff. Police departments are expensive to staff. Police officers are some of the most expensive employees you have when you talk to salary and benefits. So a very expensive uh, staff for a very low uh, call load. And finally, uh, police departments are high risk, high liability operations that re would require adequate, adequate uh, sorry, additional uh, funding. Sorry about that. You have to have uh, sufficient funding because if you don't, you're gonna have deficiencies. And those deficiencies, like I said, are gonna be either in man uh, manpower, man hour staffing, they're gonna be in equipment that you don't have, there's gonna be in training that you don't complete. There are all kinds of things that you have to look out for. And if you don't, you're gonna get some kind of uh, lawsuit. It's gonna be failure to re uh, train an employee. It's gonna be uh, uh, have an employee that you retain that you shouldn't. Uh, failure to supervise employees. There's all kinds of things that you have to look out for. CCSO on the other side, we're going to recommend a, a, a model here in a minute. It's a dual funding sources under a proportional funding model that strengthens the long-term uh, sustainability of law enforcement services. You've got a larger agency that has capability to leverage cost of equipment, training, and staff in response to police reform legislation. CCSO has a training staff. So uh, they have the ability to train their employees and meet all the mandates where we don't really have a training staff. We use our employees or we go out and we try to find somebody to bring training in the department. It's not efficient, so it's not cost effective. CCSO has numerous career development opportunities and a greater capacity to recruit and retain law enforcement employees than they do. They have uh, many more specialty positions than we do and they have staff devoted to recruitment so those are things that they have that we don't. And obviously, if you look at the call, uh, call demand in this shared beat we're gonna talk about in a minute, neither one of us on our own could staff this particular beat uh, with staff, sufficient staffing, because there's not enough call load in there for either one of us to have that. And finally, Clark County assumes the liability for law enforcement services, except for city ordinances, which we would continue to uh, absorb the liability for those. That's the case where we enforce uh, an ordinance on somebody, a city ordinance. It's later found out that the ordinance is maybe uh, defective, not constitutional. Somebody sues us. Uh, in either scenario, we would pick up those costs. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what we call the center beat. Uh, this is a brand new beat we would carve out of the north part of the county in the corner here. The call load's about 50-50. If you look at it, it's about 51% CCSO and 49% uh, Le Center, City of Le Center Police Department. 
When I say call load, that is calls that come in from the community. And we looked at the uh, call load all the way back to January 2017 to make sure we had enough of a sample to make sure it's correct. And you can see uh, in this breakdown here where the population is, the number of housing units in the square miles, the entire beat is only about, uh, it's about 40, 40 some square miles. It's about 40, 44 square miles. And this would allow, uh, with sufficient staffing, we would, uh, in order to staff this beat, we would contract out with the sergeant and eight deputies. And that would give us the covers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. We would always have that. If anybody called in sick, had to go to training or any of those kinds of things, uh, the under contract, they would have to, the sheriff's department would have to fill that hole. So we, we would always have three people on 24 seven, which would be a day shift, a night shift, and an overlap shift, which is something we don't have now. Next slide, please. So what's this uh, partnership look like? It's 24 seven, 365 days a year with a guaranteed staffing and overlap shift. CCSO would provide a sergeant assigned to the city of La Center performing the chief of police responsibilities, where by law, we have to have somebody designated as our uh, chief of police and we would designate this position as our chief of police. We have eight deputies to staff the La Center beat. CCSO is responsible for all recruitment, training, minimum staffing, and also staffing for special events. And we have some kind of uh, event in the city, a parade or, uh, or anything like that that you have down by the river. We would have, uh, uh, if we wanted deputies there, we would have to we would have the ability to have special events staffed, which is something we don't have now. Our officers aren't mandated to work special events. Sometimes they'll, they're willing to do it, and sometimes they're not, and so we don't have anybody there. CCSO will continue to provide additional services such as detectives, bomb, bomb squad, canines, SWAT, and any other city uh, services that they provide routinely to the county. We would have 24 seven day a week supervisory oversight, which is really important for risk management and trying to reduce liability. You need to have sergeants on duty now 24 seven, especially when there's any kind of use of force, you wanna have a sergeant respond to the scene. If you have a pursuit and the sergeant that has to make the decision whether to stay in the pursuit or not, you have 24 seven supervisor coverage for that. Currently, we on our best day, we have about half the period covered with some kind of supervisory coverage. So in this case, we would have a 24 seven and uh, a lot of the new laws mandate uh, require officers to go currently like a use of force, a supervisor would go out and investigate it right then and there. Under our current system, we get them after the fact that there's no supervisor on duty. It's not an efficient system and it, it does cause holes in liability. CCSO has a much greater pool of police deputies. So if there's a kind of some kind of hole because of training or sick leave or something, they can turn to a big uh, labor force in order to fill the holes where we can't. Uh, you know, a lot of times our officers were on, we were limited to five guys, five or six uh, police officers, and it's hard to fill overtime. Uh, they don't have to fill it if they don't want to. And uh, it, for us to fill overtime, uh, is generally somebody's on their day off or on vacation and, and it, it causes co uh, conflicts there. CCSO assumes all liability costs associated with providing law enforcement services, again, except for city ordinances, would be a five-year contract with two five-year renewals. Either party can give notice starting year four to pull out. And uh, part of the cost that we're talking about right now that's in negotiations is what the COLA would be. The COLA every year would be somewhere between three and 5%. Uh, I'm sure that uh, they're looking at five, we're looking at three, and we'll we'll meet in the middle somewhere, but that's kind of where we are right now. Next slide, please. So what's it cost? Remember the first year is implementation. We would have some of these costs regardless if we ramp up our police department or we contract out to the sheriff's department. The cost to ramp up is a little over a million dollars. That's the uh, total maximum cost, but you've got to remember that that startup cost, some of that cost is not gonna be, uh, be a, occur right away because they're gonna have to have an implementation period the first part the first year. So not everybody's gonna get hired and not all the equipment's gonna get purchased January 1st. The other thing is we have equipment like radios and tasers and vehicles 
that we could then transfer to the sheriff's department and credit that start off cost down so we could actually get that that cost uh, reduced. The way the implementation plan would be, would be payments based on hiring benchmarks instead of deadlines. Every time they hired so many people, we would write a check and the implementation plan will be part of the agreement that would go to council if they decide to go this direction. So the agreement would have the five year projection on the budget. It would have the actual boundaries of the beat and it would have an, implement, an implementation plan that shows you exactly uh, when payments are made. So what's going to happen after in year two, our cost for the uh, county contract would be about $1.3 million. And so almost $1.4 million. We then would have to add about $95,614 of costs that we would pay regardless. We have to pay Cressa, we have to pay our SWAT bill, we have to pay for the police facility maintenance and utilities. So the total cost of the police department under this contract would be about $1.4, $1.5 million a year. And that includes everything, including records, after hour records, property and evidence, and all administrative oversight. Perfect, uh, any kind of uh, administrative investigations on police officers, training, anything like that would be uh, borne by the Sheriff's Department. Next slide. Regardless of which way the council wants to go, either their own police department or contract in the county, the city will have, you know, police services committed to serving the city of Lacenter. And I want to emphasize that our intent is to have the sergeant and the deputies work out of the Lacenter Police Department. So for the public, they're going to have a much greater police presence in the city than we have now. And the other thing that I think is important that in the future, we could discuss having, let's say, sharing a part-time non-sworn position that manned the front counter that could allow citizens from all of North County to come in and get public records, get the concealed weapons permits, get fingerprinted. Those are things we don't do any longer. And so I think it's important to look at what the future also is uh, uh, entails. So with that being said, John, if you have any questions, because I've gone through this very rapidly, and then we can open it up for uh, or any statements, we can open it up for questions. Uh, me, John, I didn't know if there's another John on here or not. But, well, you, John, because you're, you're you're the guy with all the intellect that I'm looking for. Today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I thought you did a pretty good job. I'm I'm assuming there's going to be uh, some questions here that I can that I can help and Bob can help answer. So the, I thought we've gone over this for several months, and this is pretty concise of what we've come down to. Uh, had quite a few meetings, looked at uh, a lot of data and whatnot, but this is something the Sheriff's Office services can provide um, with an implementation uh, date going forward. So if you want to, I don't know if you want to open up from there, Bob, for questions. Sure, Mayor, and I'll turn it back over to you for uh, uh, questions and answers. Okay, thank you both. Um, to keep it pretty straightforward, I think I'll just go down our list, call council members' names, and it, you can ask your questions as we go forward, and we'll get the responses. So we'll start with Councilman Member Keeler. Any questions? Yeah, I, I do have a couple of them, and I apologize if I'm putting anybody on the spot. But, but hypothetically, we're for 2022, the preliminary budget shows us at about $2 million, if I'm correct. Um, if we were to use that $2 million to start the process of rebuilding a La Center police force, how long, taking into account recruitment, training, all the things that need to take place before somebody can start in service to the community, how long do you think that would take, Chief Richardson? Is there an estimate? Yeah, I could I could answer that. So uh, we obviously we'd have to do a police chief recruitment, and in addition to that we have to do a sergeant's promotion process because we've got a sergeant's uh, opening. And currently, we probably really don't have any applicants for that, other than that our a person is in the uh, reserve that's deployed. Um, if we're going to go for an internal internal applicant, because the other applicant is halfway moving to Montana, 
you know, his wife is there, his, he's bought a house there, he's just waiting for employment there. But we'd have to hire a chief and a, uh, think about a promotion of a, a sergeant. So those are two things in the back of your mind. An entry level police officer is about 18 months from the time we start the recruitment process until we get them out as a solo beat officer. If we hired, remember back into the spring when we were talking about academies, and I told you that if we hired somebody in the spring, there is no academy until September of this year, which means we would have to, to make sure we had that employee around, we would have to hire them and keep them employed and find something for them to do, like Vancouver and the Sheriff's Department are doing, because they don't want to lose that body. We don't have the capacity to do that. We really don't have that work for them to do here, like filing and other things. But let's say that let's say that uh, we hired somebody today ready to go. If we hired him today, the, uh, the next academy class, I'm looking at my thing. This is for entry level. It starts April 19th of 2022. They won't get out of the academy until April 24th of 2022, which means they won't get out of field training until around December of 2022 if everything goes perfect. If you're talking about a lateral applicant, I can tell you that there are uh, about six months to recruit versus a year and a half. About six months it takes a lateral applicant to get through the process, FPO training, and if they get to the equivalency academy and then they get on their own as a solo beat officer, I'd say six to eight months. The pipeline for lateral officers right now is thin. Uh, I don't believe CCSO has anybody. Um, with that being said, Remember that Ridgefield in May offered a $20,000 hiring bonus, and they just now have a lateral that they're, they've hired is gonna start November 1st. Now, since this lateral came up from a, even a very small apartment, uh, they had already gone to the academy in Washington, so they don't have to go to any academy, they go right into field training. However, if they were an out-of-state applicant, they would have to go to what's called a two-week equivalency academy. Well, the next equivalency academy isn't until January 24th of 2022. So we'd be in the same boat. We'd have to hire a lateral police officer today, and we'd have to find something for them to do while we paid them until January when they got an equivalency academy. So go, my best guess to get all the way up, if you, in a perfect world, everybody passes the process and you find applicants, it's gonna take a, a city the size of the center a couple of years to get up to full staffing. And I, I want to tell you that the applicant pool out there nationwide is not there. Uh, qualified, now qualified applicants are very hard to find. And what you're finding is a lot of unqualified applicants, people that failed a lot of processes or laterals that are under some reason to leave, uh, they're in the pipeline because those are really the only applicants we have right now. And most of the really good applicants and I'm talking the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington, because of all the police reform legislation, and there's articles nationwide and publications about this, are all going to Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. They're not coming, they're not leaving California so much for the most part to go to Washington State uh, because it's the same kind of police reform legislation they're trying to flee. So my best guess is a couple of years. I'm sure other people have questions, but my follow-up then to that um, interim chief Richardson would be under, hypothetically, if we pursued the agreement with Clark County Sheriff's Office, how how soon could that be implemented? The presentation said it would be rapid, but like well, how, how soon? Well, we, if we signed a contract today, and I'm gonna let John answer part of this because it's really his shop. Um, we would sign a contract uh, to start January 1 of next year, uh, 2022. And then I'll, I'll let John talk about implementation and what they would do. Would you like me to <clears throat> do that right now? I just, if you're really quick, if you don't mind. Real quick, we looked at some numbers because we're also in the same position that uh, Bob was just talking about hiring and we're, we're and we're losing people left and right. So a rough plan, and I want to say that or kind of how we outlined it, but but we would obviously put it in the contract. We would provide a sergeant by uh, July 1st because you need that interim uh, position. We talk about someone who can be the or, or act as the chief of police there and then we'd implement two bodies at a time. And what we kind of looked at was uh, September two bodies, October two bodies. 
uh, November and then December. So by the end of next year, we could have it fully implemented. So, but we do need some time because we're at the same issue. So it would not be, you would not have eight bodies January 1st. And that is a rough estimate, but we, we can narrow that down, but that's what we've talked about. You. Is that um, the end of your questions, Councilman Keeler? Oh, I could come up with a few more if nobody else has any, but I can. Well, I'll keep going down the list and then we'll circle back. How's that? <laughs> Councilmember Williams. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess this would be more, well, e either the chief or the commander there could answer this. Can we go back to the slide that uh, showed the area? And then I want to ask a question about the people. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Bob, I'm not sure if your area is correct. It shows 2.6 square miles for us. Uh, I, I don't think that's a correct measurement, uh, only because the other area says 42 square miles. Uh, it just didn't quite look right. But anyway, my question uh, here's the question, though, that's important. You said we'd have eight deputies assigned to a center. How would that be spread out over 24 7? Okay, we'd, we'd have eight deputies assigned to this Le Le center beat, and we would have three deputies on duty 24 7. Uh, plus, the, the sergeant would uh, work daytime as a police chief. So you'd have uh, their day shift, you'd have the CCSO day shift officer, and you'd have an overlap officer come on, and then you'd have the night officer uh, come on, and then the overlap guy, two or three in the morning, would go home. So you'd always have, in a 24-hour clock, three people in this beat year-round and that's the what I just said, the, the staffing of three. If any of them, for any reason, I had called in sick or anything else, you, the sheriff's department would have to uh, staff that B car. So you'd always have three people in this B. And it's it's at 289th and North. Okay. So there would all so we would always have somebody here in town at night and patrolling, and there would be. Uh, Two, uh, two during the day then, uh, Monday through Friday, more or less? Well, no, it'd be, uh, it'd be uh, seven days a week. You'd have three deputies scheduled during that 24-hour uh, period. So 24-7, 365, you'd always have three people. I, let's say their day shift starts at six. And I'm just hypothetically saying you, you might have somebody come in and they work six to five. Somebody else comes in and they, you know, they work... Uh, uh, you know, three to two, and then the other guy comes in and he works, uh, you know, you know, till seven at six o'clock in the morning. You're going to cover the center beat just like they cover the rest of the county. They have the same uh, shifts uh, configuration throughout the county. So you're always going to have three people just in our beat. And if we have something that exceeds our capacity, then it would be just like mutual aid now. It'd be the first unit in if it's from the center, Ridgefield, or the county. So, but there would always have, we'd always have somebody on duty and, you know, at whatever time their overlap shift starts, we always have two people on duty. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, thank you. Council Member Straven, have you joined? I'm here, I was listening. So what I'm hearing, though, uh, is the nine officers or the eight officers, is, which would be the same as if we had our own police force. So the, the time uh, to build is what is concerning, though it sounded like uh, it's going to take a perfect world for the sheriff's office to also reach the uh, full capacity as well come uh, another year, a year and a few months. Um, I have a couple questions here. The... What is the reasoning for five years for the contract? Uh, because uh, most contracts like this are five-year periods. If you look at any of the uh, any of the contracts throughout the state, they're five-year periods because it takes an agency is not going to want to ramp up 
and invest in something that's shorter than five years. Now, uh, so now if you want to do a longer contract, that's fine. Uh, shorter contract, you're probably not going to get anybody to uh, consider it. So that's that's the reason we chose the five-year mark. Remember that the five-year contract, the way it would work is in year four, uh, you would that's where you would give notice of termination, and then we'd have to have an implementation policy to ramp uh, process to ramp down. Obviously, in a perfect world, if we uh, canceled the contract and ramped up, some of those deputies would want to come and work for us. As far as recruitment, mm -hmm. remember, uh, the sheriff's department's got much more capacity uh, and will get and get more applicants than we will. They, they're, they have, you know, they give they give everybody a car. They've got you know more reasons to go work there than we would we have. We just have patrol. We don't have any specialty positions. People can't promote. So we have to remember that also. And then also remember that under uh, under the current, we're actually adding, a, uh, you're right, we're having nine employees on either 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 uh, system. But I think that uh, with the contract, you just don't have the police chief that in our city is uh, by contract can't be a working police chief. There was another- Right. Uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go sorry, ahead, John. Uh, in our, in our talks with the county council, now they haven't voted yet, but the discussions were they thought a three year was too short for the same reasons Bob said. So they seem to have a uh, view it as looking at at least a five. That was some of the comments made. So that's why we also discussed that as well. Understood. Understood. So you guys came up with a $1.5 million cost. And at this point your preliminary budget is 1.9 million for our same officers or you know same size of police force i'm trying to figure out where you guys are asking for 1.9 million and the sheriffs are only asking 1.5 million and they still have to do the same thing we'd have to do recruit and build the cost are built into the budget uh we can always uh when we talk about the budget we can we can have that conversation I don't think this is the place to have that because it'll eat up any more time for anybody to ask questions about the contract. But we certainly would have, be happy to get into the details of the preliminary budget when we come to the preliminary budget. Sure. So then at that point, um, you guys are paying, uh, uh, John, you guys are, or Officer John, I'm sorry, I don't know what your last name is there. Uh, you guys are paying your officers pretty much the going rate, right? As other officers around the area? Well, it works out. We're not close to Vancouver Police. They they have, they have to do comparisons when they do. I would say uh, it's a it's a decent salary, but around the area we pay more than Cowlitz, uh, I believe, more than Skamania because we're larger. But City of Vancouver play, pays more. Portland pays more. But they have to do comparison counties like Thurston County or Spokane County. That's the that's the counties they they uh, compare to. So it I would say we're 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 in the range of the size that we are. And then we would have the same officers, right? Consistently, there's, this isn't gonna be like a change of shift. Uh, and you bring in different officers, you know, once every couple months or whatever. So we talked about that because we think consistency would be good for the year. So how we work it is they bid every year in November what squad they wanna go to. And again, this is preliminary, so things could change if, if we get a, if this goes through. We would have a list center beat. We would want the same officers to be there. Probably 80, 85 percent of the time they would be. If there's a sick call or a vacation or whatever court, then they could get another officer. So, but I would say 80. Bob and I were talking about this at lunch the other day. 80, 85 percent of the time they will always be assigned to that beat. So you would get consistency. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I find that very important because the officers get to know the residents and know how they act and react and uh, build that rapport. So I, I think uh, that's all the questions I have for right now. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, John. Council Member Hill. Yes, good evening. And thank you, uh, Chief and, and, uh, and Chief Horst <coughs> for being here and <coughs> great presentation. Appreciate that. Couple questions for me. Uh, in, in the city of the center, we have uh, typically over the years I've been here, uh, I've always had just one officer on patrol in every one of, of the three different uh, um, slots throughout the day. And uh, as far as you can see, that will continue. Is that right? 
we, we will I'll actually have we will I'll actually have better coverage uh, because you've got to remember uh, in a perfect world currently the way that if we were fully staffed under today's staffing um, we would have uh, three officers on either side for the most part it would be two officers and a sergeant let's put it that way and uh, but what happens if somebody calls in sick and somebody that's on their day off doesn't want to come in and work it then we just run that shift vacant so there could then that's when we go to what's called priority mutual aid and we have somebody come in and help with calls until we can get somebody to come in the next day or or somebody decides to come in and work now under this system that wouldn't happen you would always have those slots filled does that make sense it does uh, but are you saying then that uh, if we go with the uh, sheriff department on this program that we potentially would have uh, more than one uh, patrol car in 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 every uh, uh, section of the day or, or quadrant of the day we, we could have, we more have than one car out there patrolling let, let make it they make it simple because it's it gets complicated because of the shift the shift hours but let's say let's hypothetically they work uh, uh i think a 10 hour 10 or 11 i think it's 11 hours and 40 minutes or 10 hours and 40 minutes something like that but so in a 24 hour period, what is it john it's a 12 hour shift just think of it that yeah. way let's say 12 hour shifts somebody starts at six in the morning and goes to midnight no six i wish they did six in the morning and goes to 6 a.m to 6 p.m the next guy comes in 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then you have an overlap guy that probably comes in three uh, in the afternoon and goes to three in the morning. So between uh, between six and three, 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., there's one guy on duty. From 3 p.m. to 3 a.m., there's two people on duty. And then from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., there's one person on duty. And but you would have always a on day shift as well, unless they're on vacation. You would have a sergeant as well. Yes. So, Chief, when you say they're on duty, do you mean they're in a patrol car uh, uh, cruising the city? They're in a patrol car cruising this beat. Okay. So there could be in some some parts of the day, then we could have more than one cruiser uh, going out through the city and patrolling. Yeah, you could. You could theoretically, yes. Okay. Um, yes. That's good. Um, the other thing is regarding the uh, the 1.5. That's pretty much what we had uh, budgeted this uh, for 2021 uh, for the police department, and with the uh, additional um, legislature legislation that's coming down, we had I think we had forecasted potentially that would ramp up to some over somewhere over two million. Uh, my question is this. Part of the reason we went through this process here was the fact that we have a shortfall in revenue coming into our city. And um, so in spending, uh, instead of spending the two point some million a year, um, we would be back to 1.5. But at this point, uh, the numbers show me that we're still going to be, there's still going to be a shortfall um, with regards to reg revenue coming into the city. Is that your understanding? Well, I, I don't, I would let, I have to defer to um, Marie or somebody does the budget. I can tell you that the 1.5 for the county contract is what it's going to cost the staff 24, 365 plus a sergeant as a police chief, which is a common uh, position under a contract city for a city our size. Contract cities generally, as they get bigger, then they add a lieutenant or commander or captain. Well, with that being said, remember, this is scalable, too. Let's say uh, in year three or four, uh, we decide that, gosh, uh, you know, our budget's going the wrong direction. We may decide we don't want 24-7 coverage. May, we may decide that we don't want uh, what they call a power shift or two people on duty. Uh, uh, we may decide, hey, we don't want to have a, a police chief. We'll designate the, the sheriff as the police chief, and, and we won't have a full-time dedicated body to the city of Blue Center. Uh, there's all kinds of things we can think about doing, but at least it's scalable. We're not, uh, and much more easier than what we have now, because now we have to lay people off. Uh, we may contract out, uh, uh, you know, some other positions. I don't know. So I, I just want you to know that 
I don't know what the future looks like as far as the budget. I know we we're deficit we have a deficit in spending every year, but I think it's better to spend 1.5 and be fully staffed and not have to worry about recruitment and retention and not have to worry about liability versus having to pay 2 million and have to take over all those things and still not knowing if you're ever going to get to where you need to be. I, I certainly agree with you there, Chief. And then finally, a, a question regarding uh, um, the police contracts. Would we then, uh, under this scenario, we then would be, uh, uh, our coverage would be under the, uh, uh, the sheriff's department as far as the uh, contract. It'd be a sheriff's contract. It would no longer be a, a Le Center contract. Is that correct? Are you talking about labor agreements? I am. The labor agreement would be that uh, be the uh, deputy sheriff's guild. Uh, so we wouldn't have any, we'd be out of the labor relations business also. That would be strictly between the sheriff's department management and their their guild. I think that's also a plus too, that uh, that, that can be pretty costly as well. So at this point, uh, thank you for uh, your information and your answers. I, I do have one more question, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so at the 1.5 million, are is there going to be uh, price increases each year, cause or anything like that? Yes, it's going to be built in the contract. We haven't uh, agreed on a number yet. We know it's going to be somewhere between three and five percent a year. Um, obviously, obviously, you know, we would like three. They would like five. We may come down to uh, four, but we're still talking about that. My preference would be okay. three, three and a half. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that, that'd be great. Uh, and just for verification, you're saying that the contract is scalable, so we are not, it's not static there for five years. So if we came back and said, oh yeah, this isn't working for us, or that the uh, uh, we, we need less officers, the county is going to be in agreement of lowering that after well, trying to get this what, going? I'm kind of confused. I think I may, I may have, uh, may not be clear on that and now that you brought that up i would have to probably retract that i think that the, the five-year mark is where that would more likely occur uh uh and i think john's shaking his head there so i think the five-year mark is where that would happen and you have to remember it's going to take at least it's going to take almost 12 months to ramp up so we're really talking about year two three and four uh and then you know year five but um i think that uh it would be better for both parties that if we agreed that if we try that we stay with the funding we've agreed to in the in the five-year contract and then when we hit the five-year renewal we can decide that hey the contract we can we, we want to change what we're paying for we want to either take away or add and or we can decide you know what it's got too expensive and we would prefer to just ramp up our own police department and we'll pay pay for that so that's really your alternative Okay, and then as far as the ramp up period, are we paying full payments starting January first, or does it no. uh, go with does it coincide with the ramp? It go it coincides with the ramp. When we when they hire bodies, we know what a body, a, equipment, a car costs, and and, and the other uh, other costs behind that. So we'll it'll go with bodies. So be as they implement bodies, we'll write checks. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Keeler Williams, do you have additional questions? Well, I was just going to ask um, whoever's running the slide deck, could we go back to that slide that had the the kind of staged costs of going with this contract? I think it's the next. I think it's the next couple, maybe two slides down. Nope. Okay. Never mind. Are we, is, will this slide deck be shared with council? Sure. Absolutely. It's a public, Thank you. Public, public document. Great. So I don't I know if this, is, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I had nothing else. I have another question, if I could, please. Um, Okay. Chief, on, on the vehicles themselves, uh, how will they be identified um, for the within the city limits? Has that been discussed at all? Oh, it has been. It's a big uh, big discussion, and I'm going to defer that to John, because uh, <laughs> he's the expert on that. 
so we decided, Bob and I met, and he said that was uh, a concern of some people. <clears throat> and I said, I don't have an issue with whatever you want to call it. There's some pretty good, uh, we would probably have magnets because there's a time that that car may not be using the, the center area, but we could say serving the center area or kind of whatever you'd want to say, it would be identified on each side underneath our star or whatnot, so people could see it. So that's not an issue. What it says is is up for, you know, whatever we come to agreement on. Thank you, I appreciate that. I've got a, another question here on the, oh, that's a slide. That's I think the one I wanted to see, thank you. Go ahead, Justin. Nope, I just wanted to look at the numbers again. So in the in the past, I don't know if this is an appropriate question for this meeting, Chief, but in the past, when we had our own police department, how much were our, our colas typically? Do we know? I mean, I know what somebody knows, but. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to, uh, okay. maybe Janice knows or somebody else that, uh, uh, we know that question, but it's it's probably somewhere in the the range that's being currently discussed, like that five percent, three percent. Depends on how far. Yes, uh, it was in that range of three, and uh, it will be because that's the current range for colas because Got of it. the inflation. Mm -hmm. The last the last contract we had because of the big dip in the budget we had one year where there was no increase and then that was bookmarked by 2.5 and 2.5 but but we are definitely going to be i mean all unions are going to be in the three to three and a half percent just because of the inflation rate right yep. okay what do you happen could you which year was it that we were unable to provide colas do you remember it was, uh, I think it was the the 20, I can get you that information, but I think it was 2020. So it was the year of okay. the pandemic. Right. Uh, and for 21, we gave 2.5. Uh, okay. So we had a huge decline in 2020, and that was the reason that there was no increase at that time. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Council uh, Member Stoben, did I hear you with another question? No, I, I have none at this point. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Mayor, could I ask another question, please? Yes. Uh, regarding the, the coverage of the deputies that are assigned to the city of La Center, will they, will they be, and they'll patrol in the city of La Center, will they be patrolling the area outside the city limits or will they only respond if there's a call out there? They will patrol both uh, the city of the center and the county area within this shared beat. Uh, we have looked at call. I looked at uh, call load, a heat map of call load. And I can tell you that if you look at a heat map of call load, most of the calls, even in the county, uh, and you can look at both agencies, it's obviously in the city of the center, the junction up at the Paradise Park, and then a little bit, uh, there's a, uh, a mobile home park up in Woodland along the I-5 freeway. And that's where most of the concentration of call load is. Uh, but when we talk to John and we've had these conversations, the deputies are gonna gravitate to where the people are and the people are gonna be in the center and up at the junction and, and those kinds of things. But yes, to answer your question, they can patrol either. Makes sense. One of, one of the things we do have problems with here is morning morning and afternoon traffic with the school and speeding. Uh, would we be able to focus emphasis as we see it necessary? I would, uh, John, go ahead. But I'm sure they have the same issues that, that we get. That's, that's why we're assigning a, an actual sergeant to be the, uh, the liaison or the chief of police of the center. So those those things would go through them and then they would distribute out just like a, it's a, a center beat up there. They would have those concerns and again the sergeant's a working sergeant as well if there's just not a they're not in a suit and a tie they're in a uniform in a car and our sergeants do traffic stops and they go to calls as well in the county so but they would have the administrative duties they would go to the council meetings and um 
and do and and be the representative as being the chief. But I think though all those things are are would come up in in any city and they would be addressed that way. So I don't have any quantitative data to say to go back to your question about would they patrol other areas. And so I'm just throwing this as my opinion at 32 years. When you have a uh, an area where there's a lot of people and there's a city and you're called the center uh, B car and there's a precinct there for them to do reports and use a restroom and food and stuff. My guess is the deputies will hang more out in the, in the city of the center than they will just out in the other areas unless there's a call. Now, again, that's just my opinion, but that's just typically what how people and patrol deputies work. Uh, but if there's a, a call, they can patrol other areas. If there's a, a nuisance in a part of the uh, county, North County, they might be doing that for a few hours that day. But the sergeant will know, uh, will have an idea of where the deputies are at. And uh, to tag on to that, part of the, what we wrote into the uh, draft agreement, uh, we will work with a company called First Watch, which is the, they're a third party software vendor for, and they, they have uh, statistical software, they tie into our, the county's or Crest's CAD system. And we analyze data we, and they've written custom reports for us. They wrote custom reports for uh, the police assessment. And what we'll do is we'll have some custom reports that monitor what the call load is within this beak, inside the city, outside the city, response times, all those things you would normally track. So we can look at it, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year, just to see if there's any issues. So that's, that, that is part of uh, the agreement and part of what the sergeant's responsibility would be is to just make sure that everything's running smoothly. We know this is, this, this uh, if you approve this, it's gonna be a, like a new marriage. It's gonna take a couple of years of you know figuring out uh, how we don't make uh, you know how we work together well and uh, you know what side of the toothpaste roll you roll up you know and those kinds of things and so those are things that we know we have to work on but I think uh, uh, John and I are committed to making sure that you get the best service you you can afford and I, and I really think that uh, this is kind of a unique shared beat is a, a unique plan but it it does serve not only in the city of the center, but if you remember in the spring, a lot of the people that came to the council meeting when we were talking about the police department were people that live inside the La center zip code, but not inside the city limits. And they were also concerned about losing the La center police department. We're actually gonna provide them better service too. And the county's paying for a portion of that. So that's why it's, it's a proportional cost. So I think that's important to remember too. Yeah, that's good. Uh, a question for John. Uh, the assignment of the deputies, the bid process, is it purely by seniority or is there preference for the deputies that live here in La Center? Uh, how, how does that uh, uh, sort out? Okay, my guess on that will be that for the deputies, it would be seniority. For the sergeant, we're going to make it a specialized position. So that would be a selection process that you guys could be involved in. So the deputies, more than likely, it would just be a seniority based on that squad. Yes. Okay, because we have several deputies that live here in the center, and we see their cars in the driveway. So, just curious. Thank you. Yes. Does that also mean that we would be, or the sheriffs would be offering the current officers a job, or are they would they be let go? Well, that's a discussion we've, uh, Bob and I have talked, I'll let him talk a little bit about the RCW. I believe that the, you have two on the books right now. I, I could be wrong, but but there is a, there are some RCWs covering that, uh, but I'll let Bob Bob talk about that. I'm not sure how much time we have tonight to discuss that, but that is a, a conversation. I, I'll just, I'll go over it very briefly. Uh, to answer your question, council member, there, there are three RCWs and I'll give you the, the first one. Uh, it's, uh, 41.14.250, and then there's 260 and then 270. And that outlines the process. If a city contracts out with a uh, sheriff's department, there are provisions in the RCW on those employees can take the initiative to apply directly with the Civil Service Commission of the county for employment and retain their seniority as long as they meet the hiring standards of that agency. So it's employee driven. We have to give them notice that that option is there, but it's employee driven. I'm sure there's other things we have to, Janice would have to sit down and talk about because it, it is a change in working conditions and we have to meet and confer. But uh, those three provisions there would kind of 
answer your questions in more detail. And really, uh, it only impacts two employees. Obviously, it impacts uh, uh, our current sergeant and then our officer who's deployed overseas. I, we don't have any other employees, I'm sure, that would be interested in uh, the officer that wants to go to Montana, doesn't want to do police work in Washington anymore. Yeah, understood. Uh, so this being a preliminary work session, are we going to schedule another work session then to go over more finalized information? Uh, that's up to you guys. What you want to do as a council, uh, you know, we can talk about this. What I'd hope to do is if we have another work session, have it as soon as possible. And maybe if we have it uh, done by then, have, a, uh, have the agreement so you can look at that so you actually see what you're buying. And uh, I think that would be the way to go. But again, it's up to whatever you guys uh, decide you want to do. I'm more than happy to provide more information. Liz, you're, you're muted, Liz. Sorry about that. Chief, what timeline do you project needing um, to put together, um, you mentioned a draft contract that we could look at before we moved ahead? And I'll de I'm gonna defer to the city attorney on that. Uh, I know that he's had it and maybe he could give us an idea of how long it would take to get some kind of preliminary agreement together. I think if we had the language before us, um, that would be helpful in driving additional questions and clarity. Um, any other comments or concerns, Council? Maria, are you on? I am. What does our calendar look like as far as when we have space available for another workshop? We have space available next week, the third, for a 5.30 work session if we would like to. Let me jump in here on the timing. Um, so I've seen a draft of the interlocal agreement. There were uh, a number of exhibits or addendums to the draft that um, define some of the economic and uh, personnel uh, assignments or you know numbers of deputies and what have you that were not in the draft that I saw. Uh, I'm gonna work with uh, Chief Richardson and Mr. Swanson on fleshing out the sort of the business points of the agreement uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, but I have not had any communication with the prosecuting attorney's office who also has to weigh in on this. So I'm a little bit at a loss as to try to give you a credible uh, schedule for having a agreement that we can present to you without even having had a single conversation with the attorney for the county. Um, so I think next week is optimistic. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm raining on anybody's parade, but uh, we're probably looking at at least a couple of weeks out. We could we could still do a, walk, a workshop if that works for everybody, just because I, I know everybody's going to look at this, read it, and you're going to go to bed tonight. You're going to wake up with all kinds of questions tomorrow. So <laughs> you know, it would be good to have another workshop to flush those questions out. I know that Councilmember Strobin wants to look at the the police budget in the preliminary. Uh, uh, draft budget, so I think that's a good thing. And then we can come back and have another discussion. In the meantime, I will work with uh, the city attorney and John Horsch and uh, John uh, Jeff Swanson because there are some addendums like the uh, transition schedule, the ramping up part of it, really the sheriff's department has to do because they know their capacity. And so we, we will, and then we have to do some final uh, uh, talks on the actual cost, which is predominantly the COLA. And uh, so we'll work on that. So that would be my best recommendation. Uh, we, we need to keep moving forward, but I think as long as we're moving forward, we're okay. Because at some point we have to make a decision one way or the other. And, and come January 1st, regardless of what the budget is, we're gonna have to, uh, somebody's gonna have to start hiring somebody. So. 
I, Chief, I completely agree. We don't we don't have to have a uh, nailed down to the detail uh, agreement in order to do another work session. You're right. I am so out next week, um, <laughs> so I would not be able to attend that workshop. I would like to see another workshop, though. I would like to keep this moving forward. Um, the citizens have waited, and it's been a jungle at best. So, uh, Council Member Strobin, can you call in? Uh, I'm going to be about three hours ahead of you. I can definitely uh, go for it. I mean, it'll be what 8:30 that that time there on next Wednesday. Is that what you guys were saying? Correct. Yes. Yeah, you, you know what, go ahead and arrange it. Um, if you guys record it, I can also watch it. And if there brings up any questions, I can always uh, submit them to Chief Robertson or, or uh, uh, John there. All right, we'll move ahead then and keep it on track. And um, we'll go ahead and adjourn the work session. Thank you both. And we have a long agenda, so I'd like to keep us on track. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to take a quick break? You may. Um, I'm going to keep us moving since we have a long agenda. You may right. step out if you need to. That way we won't be keeping everybody waiting. No, go ahead, keep moving. All right. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for um, joining us this evening. And um, it is our regular scheduled city council meeting for Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. And I believe we're still recording. So we will begin with um, asking the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we please stand? I pledge allegiance. To the, flag to the flag of the United, United States, States, of America, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. <clears throat> Clerk, um, can you proceed with the roll call, please? Uh, Mayor Thornton. Absent, excused. Councilmember Keeler. Present. Councilmember Williams. Present. Councilmember Strobin. Here. Councilmember Hill. Present. And Mayor Pro Tem Servany. Present. Thank you, everyone. Takes us to our consent agenda. If there are no requests to remove any item, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. <clears throat> Takes us into our presentations and proclamations. And we have a proclamation this evening.
for Native American Heritage Month, November 2021. Whereas during National Native American Heritage Month, we celebrate the rich tapestry of indigenous peoples and honor their sacrifices, which we recognize as inextricably woven into the history of the country. And whereas Native Americans are descendants of the original indigenous inhabitants of what is now the United States. And whereas Native Americans have moving stories of tragedy, triumph, and perseverance that need to be shared with future generations. And whereas Native Americans have enriched our heritage and continue to add to all aspects of our society through their generosity of culture and the continued practice of teaching economic, environmental, and cultural sustainability. And whereas our country is blessed by the character and strength exemplified by the Native Americans who have answered the call of service in our armed forces in greater numbers per capita than any other group in the United States. We honor our Native American veterans and those who serve in active duty for their bravery and sacrifice. And whereas the city of La Center renews its commitment to protecting the tribal sovereignty and self-determination of Native American peoples. And whereas the city of La Center is committed to engaging in dialogues led by tribal communities around the opportunities and work in which they are currently engaged in areas of self-determination, sovereignty, and cultural preservation in order to create an active government to government collaboration. And whereas during the month of November, we honor our native peoples in this, their ancestral homes, and recognize their continued cont contributions in strengthening the diversity of our society. Now, therefore, I, Greg Thornton, Mayor of the Center, Elizabeth Servany, Mayor Pro Tem, do hereby proclaim November 2021 as Native American Hist Heritage Month and encourage all citizens to join in this observation observance. <clears throat> Clerk, can we take a roll call vote on that, please? House member Keeler? Yes. House member Williams? Yes. Councilmember Strobin? Yes. Councilmember Hill? Yes. And Council or Mayor Pro Tem Servany? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, everyone, I've got too many papers on my desk here. I'm sharing it with my husband. <laughs> Wrong thing to do. Um, that brings us to public comments. Clerk, would you like to read those into record for us? Yes. So first one, uh, Candace Irish, 1653 East Heritage Loop, Center, Washington, 98629. Citizen public comment, please read at the October 27, 2021 City Council meeting. My concern is regarding the status of our city having open public, public City Council meetings. I remember some time back, uh, Mayor Thornton said the city was working on opening the community center as well as offering the Zoom meetings. Other cities offer both venues, and I know I am not alone in wanting to attend and speak in person. Just as a thought in the interim while you work this out, why can't the citizens be unmuted during the citizens' public comment period so those attending the meeting online could speak for their allotted three minutes? For those that send in comments, 
that send their comments in. They could be read either before or after those wishing to speak had their time. I know this can be done as you have unmuted citizens during public hearings. Thank you for your attention to this concern. I look forward to hearing from you. Candace Irish. Uh, this one is a follow-up from a previous uh, public comment as well. Uh, good afternoon. With the recent wind and rainstorms, I wanted to follow up on what was being done to ensure that this tree does not present a safety issue to the general public. Thank you, Christy Humphrey. Ten twenty seven twenty twenty one. Mayor Thornton, Council, Citizens of the Center. It has been pointed out that there is a difference between budgeting and staffing. My question is when, month and year, was the last time you actively recruited officers to fill the vacancies left at the Lucenter Police Department? Anticipating your answer, Nelda Perryman, 824 East Pioneer Loop, Lucenter, Washington, 98629. Maria, you had some information about um, and follow up to the um, initial letter. Did I read this last one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, forgive me. No worries. Um, October 27, 2021, John Jokola. 1404 East First Circle, La Center, Washington, 98629. General comment, dear city council, I have deep concerns about hate speech on public property, specifically the sale of Joe and the HO and F dash Biden merchandise in the public parking area at the south side of the bridge. When I approached this vendor and asked about having a political conversation, he strongly stated he was having he was not having any conversations. His sole purpose is to sell merchandise. Since I wanted to be sure I heard correctly, I again pointed out his obvious interest in politics, but was told again, unless I purchased merchandise, I needed to leave him alone or he would call the police. So a third time, again, just to be sure, I questioned how on public property he could ask someone to leave and his angry answer was to buy something or he'd call the cops and have me removed. I later made a public records request to find out the licensing for this street vendor. On August 20, Maria Swinger Inskeep let me know via email the city had no copy of a city issued business license. I would need to request their state business license through the Department of Revenue. The couple selling these banners were not campaigning, protesting, expressing free speech, or holding a rally. By their own explicit explanation, they are there only to sell merchandise. All practical definitions do define them then as a street vendor per city code. I am asking you to enforce that code. In accordance with the Lucenter Municipal Code 5.40.030, street vendors need to have a secured, need to have secured a city vending license, and the license need to, needs to be exhibited. An exception only exists for farmers and gardeners with their produce. No exception exists for banners, flags, or political materials. Section 5.40.050 explains the process for obtaining a license obviously not being enforced. And specifically, Section 5.40.070, Part 3 states, vending units must be placed on private property. Part 4 states, street vendors are prohibited in public parks, which I'm sure the property surrounding the entire bridge is all considered public park. A proper licensed vendor of flags, eagle banners, or shirts on private property I have no issue with, but hate merchandise should have no place on city property. And that is all. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem, did you want me to respond to Mrs. Irish's Question. You referenced you had information, so please proceed. 
I do. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank Mrs. Irish uh, for her question and comment tonight. And as far as I'm aware, there is just one city in the county that is currently having in-person council meetings. And because a virtual component is still required, we have not been able to get the technology working where we can have both the in-person and the virtual at the same time. But we will continue to work on that. And then hopefully when we get into moved into the new building, that will be easier to get set up. And then as far as people publicly speaking their comments, that is something that we would be open to considering in the future, although it has been working well to have our deputy city clerk read those responses. But thanks again for, for your input. Thank you, Maria. Under mayor's report, I do have two announcements to make. Um, the first, as we've mentioned earlier in our work session, we do have our city council meeting scheduled for next Wednesday, November 3rd. And you just received, council just received an invitation um, for the work session that will begin at 5.30. There's also a virtual mayor's town hall that is scheduled for Thursday, November 4th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. And that takes us to attorney's report. Bronson, do you have anything to come before us? Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. No, there's no attorney's report this evening. Okay, thank you. So next up is brings us to council comments. We'll begin with council member Keeler. I was able to attend the um, grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony for the new middle school. And I just have to say what a lovely facility. And I am certain that it will serve our community well into the future. Thank you. Council member Williams. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And as Councilmember Keeler said, I was also able to attend the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, it is a wonderful facility. Uh, I'm very proud of our school district. Uh, uh, my three children that went through it did very well here. Um, and this new building is just frosting on the cake. All the all the amenities it has. This is going to be great. This building will last well into uh, hopefully the next century. Uh, Good luck to the school district, and uh, they did a great job, and especially staying under budget with change orders. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Strobin. I have nothing uh, tonight, Mayor Pro Tem, except that I uh, may have to attend this meeting uh, virtually as well next week, uh, as I will be out on vacation. Okay. Thank I you. may be absent. Just want to let you know. Thank you. Council Member Hill. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And again, uh, uh, like several uh, of council members, I attended the uh, uh, ribbon cutting at the new middle school. And uh, it's been a three year project to get that built. And I was just really pleased to hear from uh, our outgoing superintendent, Dave Holmes. Uh, speaking so um, uh, well of our city, he made a uh, special note of thanks to uh, Mayor Thornton uh, during the last couple of years, particularly helping him and being in touch and helping to move things through as well as city council members, as well as our uh, city public works, uh, our uh, engineer uh, inspectors and so on. And uh, they were, he was just uh, very overwhelmed uh, with with the kind of support that he was receiving uh, during this uh, build process, and the community uh, uh, gave a big roar of appreciation at that uh, that comment. So I think that speaks to all of our city and our communication and working with our school district. We've got a good working relationship there. Uh, I would hope that we as we move forward that would continue. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you, Councilmember Hill. 
That takes us into staff reports, and we will begin with our finance report. And Maria Swinger Inski will present. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Servini and City Council members. The September sales tax disbursement was $81,164 compared to $65,868 a year ago. I attended the ICMA annual conference in Portland. This was a four-day in-person conference with city and county managers from across the world. Sessions attended included topics covering finance, management, community engagement, social media, workplace culture, and more. And all I can say is it was great to be back in person for a conference. I also attended trainings this month sponsored by MRSC and RMSA, which is our risk pool. They included countering social media misinformation and cybersecurity essentials for leadership staff and elected officials. And as you probably know, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Tony Cooper and I also attended public assistance contracting and procurement training, as well as preliminary damage assessment and documentation training. And those were both focused on FEMA related events. And you'll see us attending a lot of trainings and continual training is important and often required for receiving grants and other funding opportunities and regulations that we must follow as a city. I have some great news. The city will have a holiday celebration on Sunday, December 5th, starting at 4.30 p.m. Activities will include the tree lighting, a visit from Santa, free books from the library, cookies, hot chocolate, hopefully a laser light show, uh, music from Le Center bands and choir, and more. So we encourage all the community to come out and join us. We recently hired Teresa Johnson to do an assessment of payroll, which had been not had not been reviewed for several years. We do not have established policies and procedures in payroll, which became clear with the departure of our payroll accountant earlier this year. The goal was to establish industry standard payroll procedures and processes. And we learned uh, that the city had not been processing LNI appropriately and miscalculating pay family medical leave. Uh, fortunately, the mistakes could be fixed with minimal cost or impact to the city. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we are on track for the audit next year and prepared as we integrate new health care benefits and union dues with the transition of a new union, which will be Teamsters 58. Since we are dealing with regulatory agencies, we wanted to guarantee that our reporting is accurate. The Budget Advisory Committee has met four times this year, and I want to thank those on the committee for their contribution to the budget process this year. The Finance Department has received a grant from the Washington State Archives uh, for almost $18,000. This will be used as we transition to the new city hall for organizing our file room, shelving, archiving, and disposing of the old records, and also consolidating multiple departments into one building. And I want to thank uh, Desi Ellinger Nelson for her assistance in gathering all of the info needed and preparing the grant for submission. You will next see the card room tax revenue. We dipped under $100,000 for the first time in half a year, and we have made an adjustment to our preliminary budget based on the lower numbers the past couple of months. Thank you, and are there any questions? Yeah, Maria, real quick, uh, you said the holiday celebration. Is that gonna have the Santa house calls as well? I believe that it will. So I will confirm that and we will be putting out some flyers and everything like that. But I uh, will get with Melinda and I believe that is on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We are starting it a little earlier this year. Um, that is sunset is at that time. So we thought it would be good. We have, I know we have a lot of new families and young families in the community and just start a little earlier so people can get home and get into bed and ready for school the next day. It's a great event every year. Uh, the Santa house calls, the, the, the downtown celebration, it's, it's really a good time. If anybody hasn't been, 
they should take their families, friends, invite people out. It, it's really something special. I'm looking forward to it. Any other questions? Okay, next uh, we have our senior accountant, Riley Barbera. He will present the third quarter financials followed by our preliminary budget. All right, uh, let me get this screen sharing going here real quick. And let's see here, there we go. All right, uh, so we are starting with the uh, Q3 quarterly financial update. And if you have watched any of my previous ones, you are in for a whole lot of uh, the same. However, now that we're a little farther into the year, we've got a bit better understanding of how our budget, uh, how we did, I guess, uh, in our budgeting process last year, which has definitely helped quite a bit for preparing our next year's budget, which you get to see after this. So uh, some of the highlights, uh, the general fund, uh, which is this, when you're looking at these uh, uh, financial presentations I'm preparing, that's all the departments, they fall into this general fund. And uh, so far on the year, we've had uh, a little bit under a million uh, surplus. Uh, about half of that is uh, attributable to the ARPA funds that we receive. So not necessarily an ongoing cost, but still definitely helped us out this year. Uh, and uh, so, you know, some of this has happened because our, our revenue has greatly exceeded expectations, uh, particularly in the sales and use taxes. And uh, we've also had uh, some less expenditures than we had originally budgeted as we've got a, a little bit of short staffing in some of our departments. So while that was just for the general or the general fund, overall across all the funds, we've got uh, a surplus of about 2.6 million. Uh, I know that sounds all great, but a lot of that is just gonna be spent next year anyways. Uh, so we definitely have had a lot more impact fees and real estate excise taxes coming in uh, than you know those exceeded our expectations. But uh, a lot of this 2.6 million surplus is related to capital projects that just got put on hold until next year. Riley, yep. can I interrupt you and ask you to clarify any of the acronyms that you're using this evening oh, for yes, the benefit of, of the audience? I apologize for that. Uh, so YTD is year to date. Uh, and I say year to date, that's not as of October 27th. This was prepared as of Q3 end or quarter three end. Uh, so these numbers are as of September 30th. Uh, ARPA is the American Recovery Something Act. Uh, I don't exactly know what that stands for, but it has to do with the uh, COVID relief money is essentially what that is. Uh, and I think, and I think that's all my, that's all the acronyms I got in there. Sorry about that. I'm just so used to talking finance all the time. I forget that <laughs> some people aren't exactly in finance. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Riley, have we gotten any information on how that money has to be spent or anything like that yet? Oh, there definitely are some clear outlines of uh, how we have to spend this. We have not come up with a solid plan of how we have decided to spend them. Uh, you know, there's some restrictions. Some things that they could be spent for are things like uh, making up for lost revenue. Uh, if you have that, uh, some of the other things are related to it's like one time costs. It can't be like you're making a new department. It's going to go on forever. But, uh, you know, if you've got some expenditures that need to be made uh, as a relate as a you know, result of the pandemic, uh, that's kind of what this is supposed to be earmarked for. And I think we've got about a two year period to spend these. Uh, so we're working on a good plan of how this money should best be spent. Uh, and we'll let you know when we come up with that plan, I suppose. Thank you. All right. Let's look at the revenue first. This is the fun part. Uh, everybody likes revenue. Uh, so our property taxes, uh, these are fairly close to uh, what our annual estimate is here. I guess I should start at the top. Uh, it says at the top, the annual estimated is calculated as Q1 through Q3 times four thirds unless otherwise noted. And to say that in a little bit plainer English, that just means we are assuming that every quarter is going to happen. This, you know, Q4 is gonna be the same as Q1, Q2 and Q3. Uh, it, Otherwise, I'll have a note here at the bottom saying why we're uh, kind of adjusting these. Uh, so with the property taxes, these are uh, assessed at the beginning of the year and they just kind of trickle in. They're, uh, most people make their payments in April and October. So we should be seeing a lot coming in this month. 
uh, but our annual estimate on the year is based on uh, you know what our usual remaining balance is. Remaining balance is for uh, unpaid taxes. Uh, the utility taxes, I've mentioned this every time, uh, but we implemented these solid waste and recycling services, so we adjusted our annual expectation there. We still are a little under budget for uh, you know, what we were expecting to come in there, but it's uh, still fairly close. Uh, let's see, moving along here, our card room revenue, we are, uh, you know, I think we adjusted, this report has been prepared with the 120,000 a month estimate. Uh, this one didn't get updated since we saw that last, uh, you know, this last month it came in at just under 100. So uh, when we're preparing our budget for next year, we're gonna go ahead and assume 100,000 a year. Uh, the licensing and permits was, uh, we definitely are over what we had expected this year. That is all due to all of the construction that you're seeing everywhere. Uh, and this intergov, intergov stands for intergovernmental. Uh, and so in this case, uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with grants. And we had another 475 that came in this year uh, for 2021 in those American Recovery Something Something Act funds. So, uh, you know, that's not necessarily something we can depend on long term. We're not expecting to see another 800 grand next year, uh, but it definitely did. You know, it was a nice, uh, nice little add to our coffers. Uh, charges for services, those are looking pretty much right on what we had budgeted, which is nice. And uh, the other stuff is kind of small, except for the transfer in that was uh, related to the uh, sewer and stormwater funds paying back some uh, funds that they had to uh, borrow in years past to make up for some uh, shortfalls. Any questions on revenue before I continue? Excellent, just give you some time to get some water. All right, so moving on to the expenses by department and uh, to re reiterate what I had said previously, uh, all of these departments fall under the general fund. Uh, and so this is where most of our staff is and so on and so forth. So if you look at the finance department, all these uh, projected annual estimates and projected annual variances, we are in the green on this one. Uh, just because it's green, that doesn't mean it's great news. Part of this has to do with some uh, staff that we have lost. So we haven't been paying as much uh, in payroll costs, which of course adds uh, you know, more for everybody else to do, but uh, it does mean that we are paying less and that's uh, always nice. Uh, our services, we are definitely under budget there. Uh, there's quite a bit that goes into that services line item. It's not just, you know, one consultant or anything like that. And in addition to all our consultants, there's a few other things that fall in there. And uh, so we're still under what we had expected to spend there, though. So we're looking good. And uh, the capital improvements, you'll see that Q1 through Q3, we haven't actually spent anything of that 18000 that was budgeted. Uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, upgrading our servers, which we are holding off on doing until we move it to the new city hall building, uh, which I believe is supposed to happen next month, maybe December. We'll see how that goes, but uh, that is still expected to be spent this year. On to the legislative department. Uh, overall, this is a pretty small department. Uh, salary and benefits are pretty close and it's all pretty small numbers regardless. Our services, you'll notice that we are expected to go quite a bit over. Uh, and I have that information here. Of course, I probably didn't put it right in front of me. But uh, our services did go over a bit what we had budgeted. Part of that, uh, you know, we had the, uh, I guess I just, I apologize. I don't have exactly those numbers in front of me for what those, uh, where we went over on that. But uh, throughout the, you know, the entire budget, you'll see a lot of these services that are being built out. And it's not a one-to-one, -one, but occasionally if you see these services that are going over, there is a, uh, a bit of a revenue component that's not necessarily obvious that kind of offsets it. Uh, you know, for example, our planners, if they're having to do more work than they had originally done, we will then bill out their planning to another uh, agency. So, uh, you know, just can't just look at the numbers and assume that's the whole picture. There's, uh, there's always a little bit more going on there. The general government department, uh, and I believe this is, might be the last time you see it as the general government department, uh, but this is primarily uh, municipal court related costs. And uh, we're a little bit under budget or what we had budgeted as far as our expenditures this year, but uh, it's a pretty small portion regardless. 
the police department, everybody's favorite one to talk about. Uh, you'll notice our salary and benefits are significantly under budget. Uh, as you, everybody knows, there has been uh, a number of officers that have left throughout the year, and uh, so we have, uh, we're a bit short staffed there. So while it does look good for our budget this year, that's, again, green numbers aren't always the greatest thing in the world. Uh, sir, the supplies line item, that's pretty small. You'll see that our services are significantly over what we had budgeted. And uh, a lot of this has to do with our uh, police chief is uh, he's out of contract. So he is being paid as an independent contractor rather than an employee. So, you know, you see the 256 under budget in salary, but 155 over in services. Uh, that's just essentially a allocation of expenses compared to what we had originally budgeted. Uh, the intergovernmental. So we had already paid the $64,000 for Cressa radio maintenance. And uh, the other portion of that is just a contingency expense, which is essentially if something comes up and, uh, you know, it's just contingent on unexpected factors. Uh, so we always just kind of leave that in there as a little bit of leeway. And then uh, for the capital expenditures, there were a bunch of purchases that we had put in the budget for 2021, uh, AEDS defibrillators, tasers, vests, so on and so forth. Uh, only the AEDS defibrillators have been bought thus far. And uh, we're thinking that the rest of the purchases are on hold until the next year. Uh, any questions before I move on? All right. Uh, planning and community development. Uh, we are a little bit under budget in our salary and benefits. And uh, I think we're, you'll notice that we are under what we had budgeted our benefits pretty much across the board. Uh, so that's one of the things that I'll talk about when we get into our next year's budget is uh, to trying to do a little bit more work to get that number a bit more accurate. Uh, services, uh, we are pretty much already at what we had budgeted for the year, and that is expected to uh, continue to go up. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of this has to do with just increased activity throughout the city. Uh, we just have more stuff going on than we had originally intended. So, you know, while it does mean more fees and more permits and uh, more revenue. It also means a bit more expenses as well. And uh, for the capital expenditures, that was a, uh, a computer. So went 93 bucks over budget, but uh, I think that we're all good there. Uh, public works, which uh, includes the public works operations and the parks operations department. Uh, we are over budget on salary here. Uh, and then we are, and I think, I'm not mistaken, there could have been something that was not a technically payroll salary that went into that. I need to double check that. Of course, I'm uh, doing this first presentation from home instead of my office, so I don't necessarily have all these things right in front of me. But, uh, you know, across all of these departments, our salaries are overall under, even if they're, uh, you know, over in one department, under another, it's all kind of fleshing out well. That being said, doing pretty good on the benefits on this one. Uh, as far as our expectations. <clears throat> uh, the services, they are significantly under uh, what we had budgeted there, uh, but uh, overall this department is just a little bit over what we had expected uh, in this department. And then in the parks operations, uh, a lot of these, you know, maintenance and things like that happen, uh, you know, after storms, things like that. It's been tremendously windy recently, so we might expect that to go up a little bit more, but uh, overall, I think we're looking like we're gonna be under budget on the parks operations. Uh, so that is the end of the general fund. Uh, so now we are on to all the uh, kind of the specific ones. Most of these funds will have a specific purpose related to them. These reserve fund, we are still working on trying to write a new reserve policy as far as uh, how to fund things in the future. But uh, good thing is that we did not have to dip into it uh, at all this year. It's just been making a little bit of money on the uh, interest and dividends and so forth based on the uh, reserves and then uh, some small uh, banking fees related to it. But uh, so nothing there. Impact fees, this is where all that extra activity really shows up. So these charges for goods and services, these are a lot of the park, in, park impact fees and traffic impact fees. Uh, and so while we've been doing great so far this year, we're not necessarily expecting those numbers to continue at a steady rate as they have. So uh, we're kind of expecting around maybe half of what we've gotten in Q uh, per quarter uh, in Q4. 
That being said, we are still way over our uh, what we had expected to get there. Uh, I guess that's for the traffic impact fees and park impact park impact fees. The school impact fees are uh, looking a little bit under. However, that is just more or less a pass through. Whatever we get in for the school impact fees, we pay straight out. And uh, you know, there's a little bit of difference in between that uh, 343 that we've got in so far and the 335, and that's just a, a result of timing differences. Uh, so in our capital expenditures, uh, it's not necessarily that we haven't made any yet. This is just a, a fun thing that I've been figuring out of how we allocate our capital projects between the impact fees fund and the capital projects fund. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about that on the capital projects page. So the revenue side of this is uh, the taxes, that's uh, real estate excise taxes. So anytime you sell a house or any sort of piece of real estate, we, uh, we get a little bit of taxes off that. And we've already greatly exceeded uh, what we had budgeted for the year and uh, still got a whole quarter to go. Uh, with our intergovernmental, uh, these are pretty much all uh, grants. Uh, and these grants pretty much all are related to a specific capital project. So all that money that comes in there goes right back out. Uh, so there's been a couple grants that we didn't get this year, uh, either because we applied and did not get the grant or the project has been put on hold. So we are uh, under what we had originally estimated in there. But uh, as you'll see, we are way under on what we had expected to spend. And uh, a lot of this is just projects that are being moved to next year. And I apologize that I do not have our capital project summary in here. Uh, that has what we've been doing, but uh, I've got a little bit of uh, information down in here. Uh, if you look through these notes, that'll kind of uh, say what we've got, or actually, nope, I didn't even put it in there. I apologize for that, but if you guys have any more questions on the Capital Projects Fund, feel free to shoot me an email and I will uh, be happy to answer your questions on that. Uh, the Vehicle and Equipment Fund, the only thing that we had budgeted for this year was to uh, sell one police car and buy a new one. We have not done that, and uh, so that's going to be put on hold until next year. Uh, into the sewer operations, uh, we are pretty much right on target. Uh, you know, $4,000 off on a projected uh, $1.4 million budget, I'd say we did pretty well. On uh, estimating that one, it's uh, you know since it's all fixed uh, charges every month, it's uh, pretty much right on schedule. Our operating costs are a little bit less uh, than we had originally budgeted. However, our uh, both sewer and stormwater tend to see a bit more of our uh, staff's time allocated towards them in Q4. The transfers out was a, uh, a transfer into the uh, general fund and a transfer to the sewer capital fund that have both already been made. The sewer capital fund, or the sewer capital? Yes, sorry. Uh, so we've uh, just gotten a bit of, we have not gotten actually any interest in dividends. And as I've mentioned, I think in every presentation so far this year, I intend to uh, redo our interest allocation uh, procedures, but that's just kind of been put on hold for now. Uh, and the capital expenditures, uh, let's see what we got here. So what was planned was a general sewer plan update and actuator on center, on La Center Road and a SCADA upgrade and a pump station. Uh, so the SCADA upgrade on track for 21, 2021 completion, uh, the general sewer plan update and actuator are being delayed until 2022. And the pump station project has been completed but we haven't actually made any expenditures yet. And uh, the reason for this is the school district is the one that actually paid for all of this. And then they're just going to send us an invoice for our portion of it. Uh, so we still are expecting to, actually no, we're not gonna be probably getting any invoices for that until 2022. So that expenditure is still gonna be made eventually, but uh, just likely not this year. Our debt service fund, this is paying off uh, a a loan that we have that uh, to get the whole uh, sewer and stormwater action going. Uh, and so these charges for goods and services, these are the sewer development charges. And just like the impact fees, uh, everything's been going great construction wise and uh, we are over budget there. Uh, and uh, the miscellaneous revenues, interest and dividends, you've heard me talk about that ad nauseum, so I won't say it again. 
And then the debt service payment has, uh, that's already been made, not gonna be another payment this year. That's, uh, we know exactly what those are going to be. So we're right on there. And then finally, the stormwater utility fund. Uh, we have gotten over a bit more than we had uh, originally put in our expectation for the year. And as a result, we're kind of increasing our expectations for next year, but that is a fairly fixed, uh, a fixed income, right? It's 1040 a month, you guys all get the bill. Uh, and then same with operating. I think I previously mentioned this, that uh, sewer and storm water will get some of our staff's time allocated there uh, a bit more than other places in Q4. So that might go up a bit, but overall they are uh, have a surplus on the year. And that is the end of my quarter three update. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? All righty. Am I going straight into the budget presentation then? Yes, please, Riley. All right. Well, I hope you guys like numbers because we got a lot more coming at you. Uh, so here we have our uh, preliminary 2022 budget. And uh, before I get into this, I would have to uh, give out a whole bunch of thanks because even though I'm presenting, this is definitely not just me that is putting this together. Had numerous meetings with the uh, Budget Advisory Committee and uh, their input is always greatly appreciated. Uh, I've had a couple meetings with Chief Richardson. Uh, I will notice a bit more detail in the police uh, department section of this compared to the other sections uh, at uh, multiple people's requests. And so he helped me a lot with that. And I uh, also want to thank Sarah for putting together a great report for me on the estimated revenue. Uh, really just thanks all around. Uh, to kind of give everybody an idea of how this budget process works, uh, we're doing what's called baseline budgeting. And what that means is we take the prior year's budget and we just kind of make adjustments as seem necessary. We don't just start from scratch. So uh, this is my first time creating a budget for a city. So uh, it's been a lot of fun, got a lot more fun coming. Uh, so as I've kind of been going through this and as I've been doing my quarterly uh, reports, I've kind of noticed a few places that could use more in-depth analysis. Uh, so some of those have gotten that attention already, some of them haven't. Uh, some of the things I've kind of spent a lot more time on are the uh, salary and benefits. So hopefully we can get more accurate numbers in our budget estimates for next year and uh, capital projects as well. Uh, and so overall, there's definitely some more work to do, but we've got a great start and a great team working on it, and we are going to get this all wrapped up. But here is our first run through. And uh, I've largely kept the same format as uh, I do for the quarterly updates. That way, everything's kind of consistent. Hopefully, it should be uh, a little bit, you know, somewhat consistent for tracking purposes. You shouldn't be able to tell what's kind of going on. So uh, in every column here, I've got what the actuals were for 2019 and 2020. And then this 2021 year to date, uh, those are the Q3 numbers. And then we have our 2021 budget, what we had uh, passed for this year. And then the final column is uh, the meat and potatoes, the 2022 preliminary budget. So starting off with uh, property taxes that is maria and i's project over this next week to get that levy certified uh, but for now as a placeholder we have what uh, paul had previously estimated uh you know we know they're going to go up a little bit but not drastically so i think that 567 is fairly good there uh the utility taxes uh, the only thing we really changed there was we're going to include a full year of the uh, waste and recycling tax our retail sales, you'll notice that our year to date is 637 and we're only budgeting 480 next year. Uh, a huge, huge portion of our sales taxes this year came from the uh, building of that school that we had uh, mentioned earlier in this meeting. Uh, you know, that was a pretty expensive school and they had to pay sales tax on every little piece they bought for it. Uh, and so since that project is done, we're not expecting to see nearly as high of uh, retail sales and use taxes next year. Uh, no change to the criminal justice, and I need to check if anybody actually has pull tabs in the center these days. I don't know that anybody does, because uh, we haven't seen any money if they do. Uh, but for our card room taxes, we uh, we just recently uh, lowered our estimate from 120 a month to about 100,000. Uh, we had been seeing about 120 a month throughout this year, but just recently, 
uh, it dropped under 100 for the first time. And uh, so to be a conservative, we're going to go with a 100,000 a month estimate there. Uh, so in a, a couple big changes is in this affects both the licenses and permits and the charges for services. Uh, the just two line items that go into those, uh, the building permits, those decreased from 400 to 225 in our expectations for next year. And our plan check fees decreased from 260 to 144. Uh, and again, I got to thank Sarah uh, for helping put together this report because she knows a lot more on the background of those numbers than I do. But, uh, you know, she's the, uh, we're getting uh, some input from the people that actually know what's going on with all the uh, new things that are coming in as far as uh, the apartment buildings, so on and so forth. The uh, intergovernmental revenues, uh, we're going to be seeing another 475 next year in those uh, ARPA, COVID funds, however you want to call them. Uh, that's the, again, one-time thing. You know, you're not, in theory, we're not going to be seeing that in 2023. I guess who knows how this whole pandemic action will go, but uh, that's a kind of a specific use fund. So uh, just kind of important to point that out. Fines and forfeitures and miscellaneous are all fairly immaterial, and we're still going to stick with the 400 grand a year uh, repayment from the uh, sewer fund. Any questions on the revenue side before moving forward? Well, Howdy, this is Dennis. Uh, back to your uh, retail sales and use taxes. I know that this year, uh, numbers that I've seen uh, um, from the uh, new middle school alone, uh, that number was nearly $500,000 uh, for middle school, and that's going to go away or has gone away or uh, is or, or about to go away. So I don't, I, I, I'm struggling with the fact that uh, of that um, 637, uh, approximately 500,000 of that was the middle school. And we're still we're still showing a projected four hundred and eighty thousand. Where's that four hundred and eighty thousand dollars coming from? And Council Member Hill, I do want to say that the five hundred thousand dollars that you saw was from mid twenty twenty to mid mid twenty twenty one. So part of that was received in twenty twenty. So we don't have a year to date on what the portion of it was. So just so you know, all that 500,000 was not this year. That part, part of that was received last year. Okay, I would like to see at some point here, Maria, uh, mm -hmm. that broke out a little more detail. That uh, that number seems uh, way too high for me. This you think the $40,000 is a month is what you're saying seems too high? That 480,000 for the year seems too high. Yeah, which is $40,000 a month. Okay, that's okay. it. Okay, right. So when you go back and look prior to uh, the, the middle school being built, then those were some of the numbers that we were having. And so that's why we've gone to pre-middle school numbers. Okay. Thank you. So I don't have, uh, I've only got 2019, 20, and 21 data in front of me. Uh, but, you know, if we're saying that 500 was halfway through 2020 to that, uh, halfway through 2021, I'll go back to 2019 and we're at a little over 30 grand uh, a month on average. So, yes, this 40 grand a month is higher than that. But, uh, you know, if you're looking at all the construction that's going on, which, you know, you'll see reflected in the impact fees and uh, things like that, there's still a tremendous amount of uh, construction that's going to be happening. Uh, there's a couple of uh, apartment buildings that are in the pipeline. And so, uh, you know, it's obviously not the size of a middle school, but we still should be seeing elevated uh, sales taxes compared to, you know, 2015, I guess, uh, as an example. Riley and Maria, thank you. Yep. All righty. So on to the finance department. Uh, so in pretty much all of these departments, one of the things that got special attention was the uh, the salary and benefits. So what I did with the salary is I took a look at, all right, who are our actual employees that we have right now and what positions are we trying to fill and tried to put in some uh, some real numbers in there. And uh, so I think, you know, this is a little bit under what we had budgeted this year. That's not because we're getting rid of any people. You know, we had somebody that left this year that had been here for quite a while. Uh, so she had gotten quite a few step increases. Uh, so I think this number is just going to be a bit more accurate as to uh, what we're actually expecting this year. And just for reference, that uh, that number represents 
about 2.5 full-time full -time employees. Uh, I think I'm the only employee that has 100% of my, actually, I don't even have 100% of my time in finance because I do some sewer, sewer and stormwater as well. Pretty much everybody has some of their time allocated to different departments. Uh, so when I say 2.5 full-time employees, it's 0.7 of this person here, 0.5 of this person here, because uh, everybody's kind of helping out as we can. Uh, and then across the board, I put the benefits at 40% of salaries. Uh, I had looked back historically at the last number of years. We were generally at about 38%, uh, and you know, costs are always going up. Uh, we are switching unions for the uh, civilian side, and uh, we are expecting to see a little bit of decreased uh, health costs there, but uh, I don't have solid numbers, so I thought the 40% seemed like a nice conservative estimate, and uh, so that's what we have going across the board. All right, uh, so our services, this uh, represents a bulk of our consultant fees, uh, includes human resources, IT services, the city attorney, other attorneys, and our risk liability insurance. Uh, so we've got a whole bunch of things that are going on in there, so don't just look at that and blame one consultant, I suppose. Uh, but we're still a little bit less than what we had budgeted uh, for this year. And uh, our undergovernmental revenues are pretty material, That and then our Capital expenditures, do I have a, nope, I did not have a list for that. Oh yes, I did. Uh, phone system upgrade and two computer stations, uh, one of which will be for me, so I don't have to use my own computer for these next meetings we have. All right, moving on to the legislative department. Uh, you'll see an increase in the salary. That does not mean that we are giving raises to our mayor or our council members. Uh, that is just, I pretty much just set it at the statutory maximum. You know, I look at the contract, what do they get paid per meeting and per monthly stipend? And I uh, just said, okay, if every single council member attends the maximum number of meetings, what would it be? And that just ended up being a little bit higher. Uh, and you'll notice that benefits is not 40%, as I had just said. Uh, this is the one asterisk there. They only, it's about 8%, I think, is what the benefits is because, uh, you know, we, we just don't pay the same benefits for that. They would do pay a couple things, so. All right, and then our services increase quite a bit. Uh, so one of the things is just, that's not a new expenditure for next year, that is just an allocation of expenditure. Uh, so we uh, moved 20 grand of one of our consultants from one department, I think that was from Public Works, where it was originally budgeted there and we moved it here. Uh, and then 30,000 of that is our uh, AWC insurance payment, and then there's a few other small things that make up that. All right. Police department. So we have gone over this quite extensively and uh, what this budget represents is what it would cost to have a fully operational police department that is uh, keeping up with all of the new legislator, legislature. There's some new requirements that are for next year. And so we needed to get a good idea of if we are to keep our police department, if we're gonna keep them fully staffed, what is the real cost of that? Uh, We've been, had some discussions with the uh, with the county as far as other options, but uh, in the meantime, we needed to get a good number for what it would cost, just assuming we're going forward as normal. So uh, we're just going to go to the next page, and you're going to see quite a bit more of a breakdown. Uh, these are just the, all these specific general ledger accounts and uh, a little bit more detail on these. So starting with the salary and benefits, that's actually on the next page. I'm going to move there real quick. So uh, as we currently stand, we have uh, one sergeant and two officers. Our chief is currently being paid as a independent contractor, so he technically doesn't fall in that category. But uh, based on our recommendations, we needed uh, two sergeants, uh, six officers, uh, an administrative person, and a part-time person doing records. So we put in, uh, you know, kind of like what our actual people are, some averages for what we would expect. I think we put in about 10% of an expectation for overtime and then 40% of benefits. So this includes in hiring a whole lot of people, which is probably unlikely to happen as of January 1. But uh, this is essentially what it looks like as far as the real cost if we were to have, if we were to get all of these people hired on. So into the uh, supplies and uh, there's not a whole lot in there. So these services is uh, 
You know, in fact, one I just skip straight over to the right because that's really where the meat and the potatoes of the change from year to year is happening. So a lot of these new added costs uh, either relate to the new legislature, the new requirements for police departments, or what it's going to cost to get some new police, uh, you know, some new police into the center. So, you know, looking at that uh, six new officers I, or four officers, and however many new people we were looking at, I think we had, a, we were going to say, well, we'll do 50-50, right? If they're going to be coming in as a, a, a coming straight out of the academy or if they're going to be a lateral person. So if they're coming out of the academy, they've got about a $4,000 uh, training fee. If they're a lateral hire, you know, we're going to probably just try to keep up with Ridgefield. They're offering 20 grand bonuses uh, as a new hire. So we would probably have to match that to get them to come here versus somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, just the the new and then there's background checks. Uh, and I think we had to, I think we put the number up 10 background checks. You know, if we got to hire six people, you got to assume that not everybody's going to get the job. Uh, so looking at that, that's $188,000 right there. And uh, just some new hiring, getting people onto the force and uh, getting this new equipment. Uh, and then in addition to that, not that we don't love Chief Richardson, but I think that he would rather be playing golf. So uh, to get a new police chief, we got to assume that we're going to have to pay them a bonus. Uh, we're going to have to pay for recruitment and, uh, you know, and we're also going to have to probably give them some relocation bonuses. So we factored that at probably about $45,000 uh, just to hire the person, uh, you know, regardless of their salary. Uh, and then uh, just to give a bit more detail as to what this professional service is, 100000 that seems a bit too big just to kind of leave that blank. Uh, so we had discussed a few specific ones to make sure that they were included in the budget. Uh, and uh, Chief Richardson can give you better idea of what EIS and Alexapol are. I don't remember those offhand, but uh, essentially, you know, that number still isn't changing all of that much. Uh, and then down here, we've got a few things. There's some less less than lethal equipment that we're going to need. Uh, there's vehicle cameras and there's body cameras. Uh, those are, I think we factored it was going to be like a monthly lease, and that was what the annual cost were going to be. Uh, and then this transfer out of 170. This is something that we've also been kind of playing around with of uh, how to fund our vehicle and equipment fund. But what essentially this represents is uh, two police cars. And then uh, not included in this 2.1 million is also uh, something in the capital projects budget for next year is uh, money to repair the roof on the police station as well. So, uh, you know, we started with our baseline and then there was just uh, all sorts of these things. So either to get more people in here or to uh, just to keep up with the legislation. And I got to imagine there's some questions or comments on that one. I'd hope so, because I worked a lot on it. <laughs> but if not, I'm fine with moving on. I do want to mention that one change you'll see from now until we present the next budget is that SWAT will increase from 4,000 to just over 10,000. So you will see a change there. Yes, I apologize. We've gone through over uh, all sorts of changes for this budget, and I can't 100% guarantee that all of these changes have made it in there. I've been doing my best to keep on top of things, but uh, so there will be definitely some changes between this one and next one. But uh, it's a pretty good start as uh, for what our numbers are going to look like next year. No questions? Moving thank on, you. then. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Riley. I want to take some time and look through this and uh, digest it, kind of look yep. through and see if uh, some things come to mind. Probably uh, send you in, uh, uh, some questions over or to Chief Richardson or so, maybe Maria. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, so the Municipal Court Department, this is the artist formerly known as the General uh, Government Department. So when we were kind of looking at that this year, it kind of seemed like it had a bit of a vague uh, definition of what was in the general government department. You know, it wasn't a clearly defined cost center. It didn't have any employees in it. And uh, so we kind of talked about doing away with it. And then what we decided was, okay, 90% of these uh, expenses relate to municipal court funds. Yeah, the fees that we pay the city of Ballaround to uh, use their municipal court or jail costs and uh, translation services, things like that. So what we did is we moved the small things here and there. I think animal control was like one of them that we moved out. So uh, essentially now this is just the municipal court department. 
uh, and you know, it doesn't have its own spot in the building for us down at City Hall. It doesn't have any employees, but it's a uh, it's now a clearly defined cost center. Uh, and so that's what the expend expenditures are expected to be for next year is uh, pretty much just jail costs. And the jail cost increase is what the uh, the largest increase is coming from our budget this year to next year. All right, on to community development and planning. Uh, so one of the things in these salaries and benefits is uh, we are potentially expecting our building inspector to retire. And if that's the case, uh, we're gonna get a somebody to be on to kind of shadow them for part of the year to uh, learn everything there is to learn. Can't expect to actually pick it all up in half a year, but at least try to get up to speed to uh, replace this person. So it's not like we're adding another full-time employee in the long term, in the long term, but there will be some overlap as we uh, kind of get them caught up on things. Uh, and so you'll see also that our services budget is severely decreased from 2021 to 2022. Uh, and one of the reasons is the uh, WSP consulting fees had been put in salaries uh, in our expectation this year, which is now that I see it, Said, I probably missed this in the Q3. That's why our, ex, our what our year to date so far is so far under what we had budgeted. Is uh, you know that's a that's a consultant, it's not an employee, so that they've been reallocated, so to speak. And uh, so that services line item will include uh, WSP, Jeff Swanson, AWC, risk liability insurance, and a few other things. Public works. Let me get a drink real quick. <clears throat> All right, so we've got a uh, an extra full time employee there. Uh, that is one of not just that doesn't explain the whole big jump. They're not getting another 130 grand, uh, but uh, I think this is just a matter of doing a better job of really trying to allocate not only our current employees but our prospective employees to all the various departments. So uh, even though that budget number did increase quite a bit. That's really only one full-time employee added there. Uh, and then this transfer out is uh, another vehicle. As I mentioned, I think in the future, we're going to try to get this a bit more smoother. So it's like a, uh, you know, it's set transfer every year that goes to this vehicle and equipment fund. Uh, but for now, it's kind of a placeholder. We're pretty much just saying money going out to vehicle equipment, and they're going to buy them a vehicle. And then the parks operations that is uh, sticking pretty much the same. And do I have the drop in services in front of me? I don't think I do. Anyway, so that is the end of our departments. Uh, and real quick, I'm just going to skip to the end so you can see the big picture of this general fund here. So everything that we've talked about has all fallen into this uh, into this column right here. So as it stands right now, there's going to be about a $600,000 deficit is uh, what is currently in the budget. Uh, and so we, there's still some reserves in the general fund that can absorb that. However, as it's currently budgeted, it's about a $600,000 deficit. Into our reserve fund, uh, you know, even though I did mention that we it is budgeted as a deficit, there is also some uh, reserves just in the general fund. So we are not looking like we're going to need to dip into that next year, uh, which is good because that's yeah, you know, we need to have some some reserves. Uh, you know, we don't need to have them exceedingly high, but uh, we're all we're working out a good new plan for our reserve fund, what the funding levels should be, and uh, transfers in and out. And uh, so stay tuned for 2022 and more exciting financial presentations. Impact fees fund. Uh, this is uh, where I got a lot of help from Sarah and everybody else in her department. I'm sure everybody else in her department is going to be mad if I only thank Sarah. Uh, and I actually just got an update on uh, some of the impact fee numbers about 20 minutes. Actually, it's probably a little bit earlier than that. Anyways, before the end of the day today, so those have not been reflected in this report. But uh, the gist of it is the traffic impact fee number is probably going to be a bit lower than what is our current expectation. Uh, and so we're still expecting to see quite a bit of construction next year, which means quite a bit of impact fees. Uh, so I've got the details as far as, you know, how many uh, dwellings and what does all mix up these impact fees. Uh, and I can break that out if, uh, if requested. 
And uh, for the capital expenditures, uh, I'm just going to talk about that in our capital project summary. And before I get to that summary, I'll go to this page of the capital projects fund. Uh, and so the bulk of this information is going to be on the next slide. But one of the things that's on here that's not is this, uh, this taxes line item at the top. As previously mentioned, that is the real estate excise tax. And uh, you know, our, it was way under budget this year. Uh, and we're still expecting to see a whole lot of real estate transactions next year. So uh, 500 is about what we are expecting to see. These intergovernmental revenues and the capital expenditures are all detailed on the next slide. So I'm gonna skip there. And then that miscellaneous is just interest and dividends. So what we have here is all of our projects that we got going on. And uh, so on the left side here, we've got the grant or other revenue. So if we're getting a grant to complete this project, uh, that is what, uh, so this 1.7 is a total of all those grants. I right now have it all going into the capital projects fund and I may need to split some of that to the uh, impact fees fund. But right now we're just talking overall numbers. I'll get to that at a later date. But uh, so originally I was given this list and I kind of broke them up based on uh, the city funding source. So if it was a park impact fee or traffic impact fee, uh, I made sure to uh, allocate those to the impact fee fund. The rest are on this capital projects fund. And uh, we had we had a great presentation on all of these uh, a month or so ago. Got to learn a lot about that. And uh, I honestly just don't have the time to go through all of these capital projects. But if you guys would like to uh, look at those, kind of absorb some things. And uh, if you have any questions, comments on those, feel free to let me know. But uh, so that's the impact fees fund and the capital projects fund. And so some of these ones were from 2021 budgeted expenditures that are being pushed until next year. On to the vehicle and equipment fund. Uh, this was set up before my time, and I think the person who originally set it up is no longer here. So how this is ideally designed to work, I couldn't tell you. So for right now, as I mentioned in those other departments, we just have the money being transferred into this fund and then transferred out. Uh, and we're gonna work on a better stabilization on that in that for years to come. And we're gonna actually look at, all right, how many vehicles do we own? What's their average service life? So on and so forth. But in the meantime, we're just going to say uh, those departments that are specifically buying those transferred in. So this is uh, essentially representing three vehicles next year. Sewer operations. Uh, this intergovernmental, these are the uh, biosolids and uh, yeah, biosolids. That's what that revenue is. And then uh, there's going to be no increases in the uh, sewer charges. It's uh, staying the same amount next year. So we're going to stick with the same budget number uh, and our operating expenditures. You'll see a decrease there. That's largely due to uh, just having some better numbers on the actual salary and benefits. Uh, one of the things that did change quite a bit, though, is this transfers out. It had been uh, $500,000 this year, it's $300,000 uh, last year. We are doing an extra $500,000 to the sewer capital fund. Uh, and that is to fund some of these capital projects that are going to be happening next year. If we go back a couple slides and look at the sewer capital fund, we've got about 915,000, so a little under a million in, uh, in projects for that sewer capital fund, and that would take it into the negative. So we're going to allocate a bit more into that fund. So the sewer capital fund, uh, the transfers in, that is being increased to 600,000, as I mentioned, and then this 915, that is uh, the projects that we are going to be uh, doing next year. So those are general sewer plan update, actuator, pump station, uh, yard resurfacing, and then the big one is the sewer membrane project. Uh, sewer debt service, uh, as I mentioned, the expenditures on this, it's just fixed to the loan schedule. We know exactly what that's gonna be. Uh, so we've got that one as a solid number, and then the charges for goods and services, these are those sewer development charges. And this is where I put that information that I should have had back on the impact fees uh, one, but uh, so the expectation is 184 of these sewer development charges, and uh, this estimate is based on the construction of two apartment buildings and 80 single family residences and a hotel. And then finally, our stormwater fund. Uh, so the 
uh, rate is being increased from 1040 to 1060. That's obviously not going to mean $40,000, even though we're increasing this to 240. Uh, we're just basing that on our current, you know, what we send out in the bills every month and trying to make an annual estimate based on that. And then uh, in the capital expenditures, I think there's a $30,000 vehicle purchase in there. And that does not come out of the vehicle and equipment fund. And that is because uh, these are called enterprise funds. The uh, sewer and stormwater funds are supposed to kind of act independently of the, uh, the general fund. So it has to come out of this fund rather than the vehicle and equipment. And then that brings us to our big old grand summary here. Uh, and so all in all, this is looking at about a $800,000 uh, surplus on the year, though I did just get some updated uh, numbers on the traffic impact fees. And uh, so if those go down, that will drop uh, definitely a little bit. But, uh, and this also includes a $600,000 deficit in the general fund, you'll notice. Uh, so, Overall, we're, you know, city's going to be solvent. You don't have to worry about City Hall going out of business next year, but uh, there's definitely some, some decisions that need to be made, I suppose. And, uh, but yeah, we're doing our best to get the revenue high and the expense slow. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? Very good job, Riley. Definitely. Thank you. A lot of information to digest and go through, and um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll send them over in some emails, uh, and we can go from there. Sounds Thank good. you. Thank you, Riley. Any additional questions for Riley? Thank you, Riley. Thank you. I'll turn it back over. All right. <clears throat> Appreciate those reports. Very good job. Takes us to um, the police department staff report. And for the October 2021 report, we'll turn it back over to Chief Richardson. Riley, I hope I can be as bubbly as you are tonight. So, uh, <laughs> September, this is actually September uh, crime uh, stats 2021. And we had uh, a total of 11 crimes reported in September 2021. One assault, which was a ex-father-in-law versus ex-son-in-law. We had one residential burglary, which was a, a shed in the backyard where some belongings were taken and they feel it might be uh, ex-wife that took them. And then we had nine thefts, one shoplift, six thefts from motor vehicles that were all unlocked, one theft of vehicle parts, which is your catalytic converter, and the one other, I don't remember what it was, but I know it was something other than that. And uh, putting a comparison for 2020, we had the same month, we had 21 reported crimes, five assaults, five thefts, three auto thefts, one identity theft, three vandalisms, two narcotics offenses, and two court order violations. So. Uh, as you can see and what we've talked about before is property crimes appear to be going up this year but assaults which are mostly in our city dv assaults are, are going down and probably because people are out of the house now they're not hanging around one another so they can go to work and get away on uh, page two is just a list of the cr uh, property crime incidents throughout the city uh, like i've mentioned before they're all unlocked um and uh one of the things that's in the back that I will, uh, as far as uh, crime prevention updates, I know people are gonna start doing their Christmas shopping early this year because there isn't anything to buy. So uh, uh, I know that people tend to leave their packages in their cars and hide them from uh, Santa, that's where Santa puts them. So uh, if uh, people could not do that, it would be a good thing because you don't wanna have somebody burglarize your uh, car and then you lose your Christmas presents and then, you may not be able to replace them this year. So that's page two. Page three, I did a different kind of map this time, instead of a heat map, just a property map, uh, property crime map, just kind of showing you where the crimes actually are. And uh, there aren't any really, you know, there's one little area that there, there's a, a bunch of them, but other than that, it's pretty spread out. But I think the heat map was kind of, uh, especially with such a low amount of, uh, items to track, kind of giving uh, kind of the, 
the details were getting lost in the heat map. The next one are arrests, and we had uh, four arrests uh, in September. One was a warrant arrest, one was a driving while suspended, one was a trespass, and one was a shoplifting. And then number five is calls for service. As you can see, total calls for service have actually been pretty consistent over the summer. You know, they're hovering around 167, 161, 164. And uh, this, if you look at it, the same with uh, community initiated activity and officer initiated activity, you'd expect the officer initiated activities because of our staffing, but actually, community initiated activity has actually been pretty consistent too. And uh, where most people would think that, gosh, crime goes up during the summer um, and more people are calling us, it's actually the reverse. It's actually, if you look at the winter months, when people are home more, we're getting more calls. And during the summer, people are trying to vacation and they're out of the area. Uh, so that's just uh, something to look at. And we'll continue to monitor that throughout the year to see how that works. And we can also do comparisons year to year uh, if we need to do that. On page six is just the monthly comparison, 2020 versus 2021. And obviously you can see that 2020, because of officer-initiated activity, um, we, we, as your staffing decreases, your officer initiated activity is going to decrease. Um, generally, community initiated activity is going to be pretty consistent, and that's what it has been. So that's just what it looked like September of uh, last year versus September of this year. And then number seven is just the reports by source, and you can see that reports are really about the lowest they've been all year. Again, that coincides with our calls for service, wintertime, um, January. You know, February, March, May, they're, they're pretty consistent, and then they've been dwindling uh, down to September. Obviously, part of that is, again, our police-initiated reports, are because we only have two officers out there doing, uh, actually patrolling, is uh, that's those are the ones like DUI, is driving on a suspended license, those kinds of things, warrant arrest, pretty minimal. And then last but not least, page eight is just take hey, community messaging, like I said before, uh, please lock your cars because again, all of our, uh, um, believe it or not, all of our thefts from vehicle and quite a few of our auto thefts, uh, well, we have some, October had, we had more auto thefts and almost every one of them, somebody's left their car unlocked with the keys in the car. And in one case, they left the car running in front of uh, a gas station with the keys in the car in her purse and somebody just jumped in the car and drove it off. So if you can lock your car, that would really help uh, from you being victimized. And uh, if you have security cameras, you see anything suspicious, give us a call. And just again, holidays are coming around the corner and I think holiday shopping is gonna be early again. So please lock your car, don't leave your gifts in there. Uh, they're either an attractive nuisance for somebody can see your presence, or if you hide them away from the kids, uh, somebody, and an unlocked car is going to take them and they're going to have a nice Christmas and you're not. So that's basically it for crime for September 2021. Chief, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the uh, attempted abduction? I, I really have caught like more speculation um, around town. Uh, I think the mayor said something to me a little bit about it, but I'd really like to hear what took place and what was looking at. I mean, I, my, my wife doesn't even want my seven and eight year old walking down to the uh, mailboxes right now. I, I'd be more than happy to uh, talk about that. And also if we want, we can talk about the mask incident at the school. But first the prowler or the, I'm sorry, the attempt kidnapping. Uh, remember that was turned over to uh, Clark County Sheriff's because they handled all of our uh, detective work, especially for major crimes like a kidnapping. Uh, we interviewed uh, the victim. Uh, based on that interview, they have information that leads them to believe that she was a specific target because of some information that they gleaned from their investigation. More unlike, uh, not like a random target where somebody's driving around and looking for random people to pull in their uh, pull inside their car. Uh, my experience is when you have somebody driving around randomly doing that, there's generally more than one victim, and there's some other things that leads them to believe. Uh, that she was specifically targeted uh, for this particular incident. And I, that's about all I can say uh, because it's not our investigation and I don't want to put anything out there that would be inappropriate to put out there. 
Um, the other uh, one that you see a lot of media attention on was the uh, assault on kids that were pulling masks uh, off children. I can tell you that uh, we heard about this on the Thursday that where people were out there. Uh, the officer didn't see anything and we didn't get any calls, but we did get an email that night. So the next day we were physically out there watching the crowd. And then at that point in time, there were actually two groups. There were people uh, against the mask and the people that were against the people that were against the mask out there protesting. Pretty peaceful, a little bit of like a typical protest where uh, people are throwing F-bombs a little bit, that kind of thing. But I just want to emphasize that over that two-day period, the police department got no calls from anybody, uh, a child, a parent, a school official, somebody driving by uh, that reported anything like that to the police department. Crested didn't get anything. The city hall didn't get anything. So we have to go back by the only thing we have a report from is the social media. And so if anybody has anything out there, they, they have like, like videotape of this assault or something, that would be fine. We got one email from somebody that said they wanted to file a formal complaint anonymously. And I told them that, you know, the criminal justice process, you can't be anonymous because the defendant has a right to, uh, you know, uh, cross-examine cross their accuser. And so, uh, but I did encourage them, hey, if you've got some video of something, send it to us. And we haven't heard anything. So I just want to point that out, too, because you've got those two different uh, issues in the community that uh, keep feeding off social media. And I just want to put some context to it. And But thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, that takes us to human resources staff report. And Ms. Janice Corbin will be presenting and Clark, can you pull up that report? Clark? I think we got lost. I'll just do it really <laughs> quick and that'll save everybody. Uh, we've had over 10 applicants for the maintenance one position. This is the position that Corey Short left. You might remember that Corey moved out of state to be closer to his father. The uh, applicant pool, we ended up with three finalists. By the way, all three of those gentlemen had their, um, their uh, commercial driver's license, uh, which is a huge benefit to us. Two of them are already certified. One of them is in school. The CDLs are a big, big win. Uh, and lots of employers, these are the folks who drive trucks and they're certified to do so. Uh, lots of companies, trucking companies and so forth are looking for these kinds of candidates. Uh, and two of the candidates had prior government experience, which is good because not everybody understands what it means to work in government and the complexity of, excuse me, of it. Uh, we've had a customer service position vacant since March, and that's been because of some labor relations obligations. Um, and so we hope to be filling that position. We do have a candidate identified. That candidate has worked in uh, law enforcement and also for the court systems and has been, uh, has worked in a billing situation. So I think she'll fit very well into our, our needs. We have a strategic specialist position vacancy that has been advertised. The interviews are scheduled for next Tuesday. Uh, and this will be uh, due to the, the holidays. We may not fill that position until January 1. Uh, and it's, these are two vacancies that have been in Maria's team, uh, despite the fact that uh, we, they've had a lot going on with audits and uh, integrating new payroll processes and new uh, utility clerk processes. They've done a great job. And Maria and Riley and Desi, who's our temporary, has done that. The union relations contract for the civilians is currently in the negotiating process. We've had one negotiation sessions. I think that Maria and Riley both mentioned this. Uh, the employees voted out the former union and voted in the Teamsters. Uh, we had our first meeting October the 10th. I have to say it was refreshingly productive and very professional. Uh, the Teamster negotiators. So we got, it was well done. And I think we're meeting tomorrow morning at 10. And I think that we'll be able to get something done uh, by late uh, November at the latest. We've only scheduled three meetings. 
Uh, and as can be expected, the biggest issues, of course, are going to be COLAs and health insurance. And then there's a few logistical things to talk about. Um, and I'll discuss that with the council here in a minute as we go into executive session. Additional projects that I've been working on is that we set aside a, a small amount of money for this year to revise the city's website. And we have selected somebody to do that for us. Maria and Jesse Nash, who's got a, some training in uh, website design, but also computers. We met with uh, the gentleman, Patrick Hildreth. He's the gentleman that designed Richfield's website. And uh, we're not gonna be totally redoing it. We're not rebranding it, but we're certainly gonna make it more user-friendly and easier to read. And then I've been working on revising and updating the public records policy and the procedures that go with it. And uh, the attorney, Jeff Meyer, who's the content expert in this arena across the state will be working with us on getting that done. So that's the information that I have at this point. Questions from the council or Mayor Pro Tem? Any questions? Yeah, Janice, the city website at $13,000, uh, you've started your shopping around, is that what you said? To get no. uh, lower pricing or? Well, $13,000 to do the refreshing is, is about what the market looks like. I know this is your area of your business, but it's about the area. And again, we're just giving it uh, a facelift. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would, uh, hopefully you guys can really shop around because that's extremely high, especially for a facelift. Um, I, I really can't go into it too much further without becoming a conflict of interest, uh, but I just would implore shopping around. Thank you. Noted. Anything from anyone else? Okay. How much time do you project us needing for executive session, Janice? Maybe 10 or 15 minutes maximum. So, and I'm going to okay. sign out so I can go to that. Okay. All right. We've got more ahead anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. All right, that brings us to the transportation staff report, CCTA policy statement for 2022. And Mr. Jeff Swanson will present. Good evening, Welcome, Council. Jeff. Good evening, Council and uh, Center constituents. And thank you, Mayor Servany, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Servany. Um, you have before you the 2022 Clark County Transportation Alliance policy statement. Uh, CCTA is a coalition of local businesses and government agencies in Clark County, as well as the Columbia River Economic Development Council and Identity Clark County. And every year they produce a policy statement, um, such as the one that you see before you, that highlights uh, transportation projects throughout Clark County. And uh, you can see in the center, we have uh, the featured project of the East Forth uh, Breezy Creek, East Forth Widening Breezy Creek uh, Culvert Replacement Project that we've been working on uh, for a few years. And uh, part of uh, what helped us get the uh, 1.5 million to uh, do the permitting and design work on that project and get it to its near shovel ready state um, was the endorsement of our uh, partner agencies in both business and uh, local government and economic development in the region. So my request is uh, a head nod for us to include again this coming year the logo of the city of La Center on this document. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions and then would just uh, ask each of you to weigh in and indicate your uh, willingness uh, for for that to occur. Uh, completely willing, is... Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, I think it's critically important for us to position ourselves um, on the document simply to aid us in go moving forward with the types of funding requests that we've already had great success with for our community and the ones that we know we have ahead of us. Um, and at some point, I think we'll also need to really 
address um, ongoing safety transportation corridors in and out of the center over time as the community grows. So putting our logo on this seems like um, the best approach to at least keep our faces on there and our presence um, in everybody's mind. Jeff, this is Dennis. Is there a financial impact here at all? Uh, no, there's not. Okay. I think it's a great idea. There could be a positive financial impact, which would be we would. You know, uh, we'll take we'll take that. Millions of dollars in <laughs> transportation monies. Okay. I'd say let's go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is the same one we did last year, right, Jeff? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a no-brainer. Okay. I think this is prudent. All right. And Councilmember Keeler. Please put our logo on this, Mr. Swanson. Okay, we'll do that. And then we always include in our own um, legislative agenda, just kind of a reference to this document that the council has endorsed it. Um, and I will be bringing that before you here in uh, November. Okay. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Jeff. Um, I have no additional business to come before us, but we do have our executive session to discuss labor negotiations. Uh, it will be approximately 10 to 15 minutes in length. So I see 8.06 right now, and um, we will adjourn. And earlier, Janice sent out the link to connect for that. So I would ask you all to um, sign off on this one and we will re-meet at that particular link. Thank you, everyone. This conference go. will now be recorded. All right. Yeah, sorry about that, it wasn't let me in. <laughs> Well, we are back from executive session discussing labor relation, labor negotiations, and we will entertain a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. I'll move. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you. Um, citizens who stayed on, we appreciate your participation. Have a great evening, everyone. Liz, thanks Bye. for uh, uh, conducting Bye. this. Bye. Thank you.